All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our reading of the 2005 uh, comedy classic Idiocracy, which I feel like we were living in for quite a while there. Became a very relevant film. Um, we have an amazing cast with us here tonight. Um, we have Anne to my to my left playing the role of Rita, played by Maya Rudolph in the movie. The lovely Rita, the lovely Maya Rudolph, lovely Anne. Uh, we have Travis playing a whole bunch of people, including a uh, horny guy, which I talked about earlier with him, and a lot of other people. Uh, we have uh, Logan playing uh, Diz, a.k.a. Frito Pendejo in the movie, Mr. Dax Shepard, who's a very funny man, Logan and Dax Shepard. Uh, we have Jessica playing a bunch of people, including, of course, President Camacho himself, Terry Crews, the great Terry Crews, the great Jessica. And then we have uh, Eric playing a bunch of people for us, including the narrator, the 14-year-old Secretary of State, and a lot of other great characters. Uh, and then we have uh, Mr. Jeremy down there doing our scene description, playing the Secretary of Defense, and a lot of other people, including the Owl My Balls guy, probably the best character in the movie. And then uh, I'll be playing uh, Joe, a.k.a. Luke Wilson, the average Joe himself. All right, yeah, so whenever you're ready, Jeremy, take it away. Thank, thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, Idiocracy, written by Mike Judge and Aton Cohen. Fade in, exterior planet Earth, a medium shot of the planet Earth floating in space. An important-sounding narrator begins. As the 21st century began, Human evolution was at a turning point. Natural selection, the process by which the strongest, the smartest, the fastest reproduced in the greatest number than the rest. A process which had once favored the noblest traits of man. Dissolve on pictures of great historical figures. Galileo, Leonardo, Da Vinci, Columbus, MLK Jr., etc. Now began to favor different traits. Dissolve on pictures of Geraldo, Joey Buttafuca, Kathy Lee Gifford, the guy from The Bachelor. While most science fiction of the day predicted a future that was more civilized and more intelligent. Dissolve on pictures of 1960s sci-fi style antiseptic future, handsome scientists, pristine domed cities, etc. All signs indicated that the human race was heading in the opposite direction, a dumbing down. We pan from the images over to a bunch of modern day dumbasses and fanny packs standing in line at Tomorrowland Ride, revealing that the images we just saw were from the ride. How did this happen? Evolution does not make moral judgments. Evolution does not necessarily reward that which is good or beautiful. It simply rewards those who reproduce the most. Interior tasteful apartment. A prosperous yuppie couple speaks to the camera as if being interviewed. I'm a cardiologist and I'm finishing my residency at Harvard. I'm 26 years old. This is my wife. She's a financial planner. And I'm finishing law school. Having kids is such an important decision. We're waiting for the right time. It's not something you want to rush into. The screen splits. The yuppie couple is squeezed into the left side of the screen where they chastely hold hands. On the right side of the screen appears into your crappy bedroom. A heinous, trashy white couple fresh off a hair-pulling free-for-all episode of Jerry Springer is making out, getting hot and heavy on the ratty fold-out couch. Shit. Shit, yeah. No, nah, I mean, shit. I ain't got no rubbers. Oh, shit. A beat. Then they go back at it. Ah, fuck it. The right side of the screen divides into four smaller frames as the couple's babies pop up. Left side of the screen, the yuppie couple now in their 30s, their living room shows signs of greater financial success. There's no way we could have a child now. Not with the market the way it is. It just wouldn't make sense. As they continue, they are drowned out by the right side of the screen. More years have passed. The trashy guy's looking at a check. Several kids now more grown up fight in the background. He's with a new slutty girl. You mean we get more welfare money if we have more kids? Yeah, food stamps too. Hmm. They sure they share a look then. Several more babies pop up and the frames multiply. 
the yuppie couple <laughs> ages. The frames on the right side of the screen continue to multiply, indicating more years going by. Left side of the screen, the yuppie couple is now in their late 30s. The mood is tense. Well, we finally decided to have kids. And I'm not pointing fingers, but it's not going well. Oh, and this is helping. I'm just saying before I have in vitro, maybe you should be willing to... It's always me. Well, it's not my sperm count. Right side of the screen, we feature a 15-year-old trashy jock, one of the trashy kids we've seen growing up, grow up, lumbering off the field with his arms around four skanks. I'm gonna fuck all y'all. More and more babies pop up as the right side of the screen becomes more and more crowded. It begins to push into the left side of the screen. The right side of the screen is brimming with new generations of dumbass. They are all speaking at once and multiplying like rabbits, drowning out the yuppie couple. Lower left corner of the screen, the yuppie woman in her 50s is now crowded into a small corner in the bottom left of the screen alone. Unfortunately, Trevor passed away of a heart attack while masturbating to produce sperm for artificial insemination. But I've got some eggs frozen in just as soon as the right guy comes along. The yuppie wife square is forced into oblivion as the screen is consumed by the ever-increasing generations of dumbasses, her voice drowned out by a cacophony of yelling morons. Sound fades out, narrator's voice fades in. But there would be a savior, a man who would become a legend, whose mighty hand would pull humanity from the brink of self-destruction. It was in the year 2004, in an army base in Virginia. Exterior Army Base, Establishing Day. Interior Army Base Day. Joe Bowers, 30s, is hunched over a test bench, soldering iron in hand, concentrating intensely. We get a, closer, a little closer and see Joe's holding the tip of the soldering iron to a popcorn kernel. Colonel Pops, hitting Joe in the eye. Startled, Joe drops his hand onto a circuit board, shocking himself, causing him to fall back onto his stool. Sergeant Miller, 40s, with a noticeable battle scar on his lower lip, enters. Another officer lingers by the door. Today's your lucky day, Joe. That guy out there, that's Officer Collins from the Pentagon. They were asking you to volunteer for a top secret experiment. This could be a great opportunity for you. Oh, no, no thanks, sir. I, I've just got six years to my pension and I don't want to do anything that might, you know, screw it up. Miller looks at Joe, sizing him up. You know, Joe, there's something else that comes with that pension. Something they don't tell you about. What's that? A hollow, empty feeling. Hollow, empty feeling? Yep. I've seen it a thousand times. It's that same feeling that trust fund kids and lottery winners get. It's that feeling when you've got nothing to strive for, no struggle. Drives some of them to suicide. You know how you get rid of it? You do something that matters. You challenge yourself. Sorry, sir, but remember the last time you had me challenge myself when I tried to rewire the sound system in the mess hall? Flashback to interior mess hall day. We see Miller without the scar on his lower lip go up to a microphone. Uh, testing. One, two. <laughs> Miller is blown out of frame by spark ar ar arcing off the microphone onto his lower lip. Back to present, Miller's hand unconsciously moves to the scar on his lower lip. Yeah, I remember. Look, you don't like, re I know you don't like responsibility. Just want to be left alone in your little corner here, but the truth is, this isn't much of a challenge. It's some kind of hibernation experiment. You'd really, you'd be getting paid to sleep for a year. It would be pretty hard to screw this up. Yeah, well, all the same, sir. I kind of like things the way they are. No child, <sighs> disappointed. Be Look, Joe, I wanted to give you the opportunity to, vol the opportunity to volunteer first. Thought it would make you feel better about yourself, but the fact is, this is an assignment. You've got no choice. Off Joe's worried expression, we cut to interior army base, conference room day. Highly decorated officers sit around a conference table. Officer Collins is at the head of the table holding a remote, giving a slide presentation. He's a nerdy, creepy army engineer in his 40s with a big mustache that looks out of, of place on his uh, wimpy face. Gentlemen, C-N-A-P-A, or chronological non-compatibility and peacetime aging, has plagued the armed forces for years. Some of our best pilots, soldiers, and military leaders have spent their entire careers without ever seeing battle. We've seen all their talents and expensive training go to waste during the times of peace. The officers murmur agreement. 
A slide appears. HHP, top secret. Enter the human hibernation project designed to save our best men, frozen in their prime for when they're needed most. The officers are impressed. We have selected two test subjects, a male and a female. Collins clicks his remote. We see a large, unflattering picture of Joe. This is Private Joe Bowers, an electrician here on the base, not one of our best men. He was chosen primarily because of how remarkably average he is, extremely average, in every category. Collins clicks through several slides of bell curves for intelligence, physical strength, etc. Joe's at the dead center of each curve. The most average person in our entire army. He also has no family, unmarried, an only child, parents deceased, making him an ideal candidate with no one to ask any nosy questions should something go wrong with the experiment. Various officers nod approvingly. We had a little less luck finding a female volunteer with these qualifications within our ranks, and we were forced to go into the private sector. Collins clicks his remote. There's a, pri a picture of Rita, a pretty woman in her 20s, obviously a prostitute. The officers react confused. This is Rita. Like Joe, she has no immediate family. She agreed to participate in exchange for dropping some criminal charges and a small fee. Collins keys up a slide of a pimp in full pimp regalia. Arrangement with her pimp, a gentleman here in the D.C. area who goes by the name Upgrade, which he spells U-P-G-R-A-Y-E-D-D, -D, with two Ds, as he says, for a double dose of this pimp. <laughs> as Colin talks, he clicks through several slides of Upgrade in different outfits, showing off his jewelry, jewelry driving in a Mercedes, etc. The officers begin to shift uncomfortably. Upgrade agreed to loan us Rita for exactly a year and keep quiet in exchange for some leeway from local police in running his pimp game. First, however, there was the difficult manner of gaining his trust. A slide of Collins and Upgrade share a giant bottle of champagne. We skip to the technicals, please? Sure, let me just finish here. Uh, the other officers squirm as Collins clicks through slides of himself with Upgrade, with Hose, etc. You see, a pimp's love is very different from that of a square. Squ Collins! Fine. We'll move on. It is, it is a fascinating world, though. Collins quickly clicks past more slides of himself and upgrade. Clicking some more. Oh, there it is. And some more. And some more. Jesus, Collins! Collins speeds through another dozen slides of upgrade and his hose. The crowd rolls their eyes. Finally, a slide of the hibernation pod. Anyway, the experiment is ready to being uh, is ready to be begin immediately. If, uh, if successful, we believe humans could be stored in a dry freeze indefinitely. Interior: Joe's apartment. Night: A small on base apartment. Joe is packing up his place for his year long absence and taking on the phone to his girlfriend Sharon. He's talking on the phone. I'm so sorry I had to work late. I mean, it's your last night, and you're going to be gone for a whole year. But don't worry, it's not your fault. Uh, look, I know a year is a long time. I don't expect you to wait for me. No, Joe, don't even say that. You don't have a choice. I'll tell you what. I'll make it up to you. I'll meet you at TJ Swan's one year and three days from now, October 17th. Interior office continuous. Sharon is at her desk, a secretary's desk, outside an office. She finishes the call. Okay, it's a date. Her boss, a creepy Ben Affleck type, walks over and sits on the edge of her desk. So, I couldn't help but over here, you know, if I had a girl like you, I sure wouldn't let her out of my sight for a minute, let alone for a year. Sharon blushes a little, flattered. <laughs> Interior Army Base, secret hospital room, day. Joe and Rita, the prostitute, are waiting to go through some medical tests. Both are in Army issue hospital gowns. Joe is nervous, wound up. Reed, on the other hand, is bored, hungover, doesn't want to be there. Joe awkwardly tries to strike up a conversation. So, this is kind of crazy, huh? What unit are you with? I am the service! Oh, private sector. So what do you do? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. He looks away trying to end the conversation. Wow, that's great. I really envy people who can make a living that way, doing a little bit of this and that. I had a neighbor who used to make chainsaw sculptures and sell them at the flea market. I guess I don't really have much of an imagination. That's why I'm in the army. <laughs> Rita rubs her temples. It's like she had a rough night. So you're an artist or something? Uh, yeah. Wow, that's great. Do you do like paintings or? 
Yeah, yeah, paintings. Oh, great. What kind of stuff do you paint? Rita sighs impatiently. This is more work than she expected. I don't know. People and fruit and shit. Oh, it must be great to make a living doing something you love. Ah, it's not all it's cracked up to be. A doctor enters. Okay, who wants to go first? Me! A beefy orderly enters and prepares the thermometer for Joe. Wow, a professional artist. That's really cool. Oh, yeah, she's a professional, all right. <laughs> Joe does not get it, laughs politely along. Interior secret pod room day. A small top secret room containing two sleeping pods with their hatches open. Joe and Rita are sitting up in their, in their pods. Joe and Rita look uneasy as they are strapped in, hooked up to hoses, IVs, etc., Rita looks especially freaked out as the reality of it starts to set in. A loud compressor kicks on, startling both of them. Rita instinctively grabs Joe's hand. The shit's safe, right? Joe looks around the room uneasily. Uh, sure. They know what they're doing. I mean, look at all these machines and stuff. It'll be fine. They tested it on dogs, I think. Don't worry. Joe puts on a brave face for her as they lie back in their pods. Various shots. Collins and the doctor going over a checklist. Checking all the apparatus, etc. The checklist complete, the pod doors are sealed, Collins hits a button, and a milky orange liquid begins flowing through the IVs. Joe's point of view, things beginning to get blurry as Colin leans in. See you in a year. Joe and Rita's eyes flutter and close, they're out cold. The orderlies and the doctor exit the room. After a beat, Collins follows. He hits a button labeled Top Secret, and a facade drops from the ceiling, concealing the door. Interior Collins' office day, the office of highly decorated op the office of a highly decorated officer, trophies, commend commendation, commendation, etc., are everywhere. Collins sits at his desk doing paperwork. The human hibernation project was one of the army's most ambitious projects, but it was not immune from the usual government bureaucracy. Suddenly, a horde of tough military police storm Collins' office, grab him, throw him to the ground. Angle on. A newspaper. There's a picture of Collins on the cover. The caption reads, Army officer busting an attempted prostitution ring. With Collins gone, there are only four people left who knew about this top secret experiment. Interior American Legion Hall night. A big buffet table is being prepared. All four died tragically in a botulism outbreak of a Veterans Day banquet. We see a dumb-looking kitchen worker pouring canned chicken dumplings into a big pot and lighting a little can of sterno underneath. A teenage busboy swoops out a tablecloth over a nearby table, blowing out the sterno. Exterior American Legion Hall night. EMS workers load four draped bodies into ambulances. Joe and Rita were forgotten. Exterior Army base day. The Army base looks abandoned. It's shuttered and padlocked. And the base eventually closed. A worker walks into frame and plants a sign into the ground. Future site of Sierra Vista Estates. Bulldozers pile earth onto the base, burying it. Interior Sharon's office day. Sharon sits sadly at her desk. The calendar says March 14th. Her creepy boss comes up behind her. It's been a year and a half. Don't you think he would have called? He starts rubbing her shoulders. Oh, you feel tense. Cut to... Interior bedroom night. We pan down from a Playboy Jazz Festival poster to find Sharon and her boss going at it in her boss's big four-poster pottery barn bed, tastefully covered by the bed sheets, to the sounds of light jazz. Dissolve on calendar pages turning as we begin montage. As Joe and Rita lay dormant, the years passed, and mankind became stupider at a frightening rate. A chart depicting intelligence over time. An animated line begins at the present time. As it moves into the future, it drops perceptive. Precipitously. Precipitously. Like rain. Dissolves to a few years in the future. There's now an ugly development of McMansions where the army base once stood. High speed time lapse of a building being built over the site, finally revealing a new Fuddruckers. Time lapse, last motion of Fuddruckers being torn down to build an even bigger Fuddruckers. <laughs> Which is to build an even bigger butt trucker. <laughs> Some scientists had high hopes for genetic engineering, but the efforts were slow, misguided, and quickly overtaken by the declining intelligence and exploding population. 
We see a baseball stadium. The marquee outside announces championship baseball. It's all to a marquee reading extreme baseball. Inside a runner is, qu- is caught in a rundown between second and third. <laughs> Instead of gloves, the second and third baseman brandish bats <laughs> menacingly. In the background, various players are engaged in bat fights. This is a little connection to the game. It just reads fire. <laughs> Sorry. We see huge flames rising up from the center of the stadium as the crowd goes berserk. The Zalvon calendar page is turning over images of gradually more stupid looking people, starting with dumbasses of the present, continuing to future dumbasses. The calendar page has stopped somewhere in the 2900s. Dissolve to you, exterior mountain range. Sunrise. In silhouette, we see a magnificent vista that calls to mind the Alps or the Grand Tetons. Tetons. Plagues and world wars came and went. And by simply being unconscious for several hundred years, Joe had managed to become something neither he nor anyone who had ever known him thought he had the potential to become the smartest person on earth. As the sun rises, we see that this is not a natural mountain range. It is a huge, stinking mountain of garbage, ridiculously steep and unstable. The result of centuries of stacking garbage with no plan whatsoever. We are definitely in the future. Pushing on the highest peak, a truck winds its way up a small road. A Dr. Seuss-looking path carved into the side of an absurdly steep face. At the wheel of the truck is the driver, the dumbest-looking guy you've ever seen. A fat gumdrop-headed guy with a weird futuristic haircut, an ugly uniform, and the McDonald's Golden Arches tattooed on his forehead. He's looking at a porn magazine while he drives. He alternates between (laughs) excited grunts from the porn and startled grunts as he (laughs) nearly swerves off the road. The driver manages to navigate the truck to the summit. He parks it, pulls a lever, and the garbage begins to unload, causing the mountain to quiver under the new extra weight. The driver cracks a beer and watches. In the background, we see an ominous black dust storm of epic proportions approaching like the Great Dust Bowl. The truck finishes unloading and the driver tosses his empty can on top. But the dust wind knocks it back down. The driver tries again and again. Frustrated, he finally takes the can and plants it forcibly on top, causing the small peak to collapse, which causes the next part below to collapse and a chain reaction on down the mountain. It was one beer can, more than this mountain was designed to hold. In a wider shot, we see a huge, epic garbage avalanche. The huge waves of garbage engulf the city below. Closer, we see Joe and Rita's pods emerge, riding the crest of the garbage wave. They split into two directions. We follow Joe's pod for a while. Close on Joe's pod as it comes to a stop. Pull out to reveal we are in. Exterior filthy street, continuous. Joe's pod has come to to rest on a dirty street below, a giant billboard ad of a scowling Neanderthal-looking macho man with a cigarette hanging from his mouth that reads, If you don't smoke Carlton's, fuck you. (laughs) As we pull out further, we see that every single square inch of everything is plastered with advertisements. Even the passerby's clothes are covered with ads. Everything seems to be in some stage of decay. TV screens everywhere blast out competing trash and talking vending machines complete like carnival barkers for the attention of passerby wider angle dumb looking overweight people wander around on the back of everyone's left hand is a upc tattoo no one seems to have noticed or cared much about the garbage avalanche they pay no attention to joe's pod suddenly the ground rumbles another wave of garbage comes roaring down the street smashing into joe's pod sending it flying into the air exterior rundown apartment building continuous a half-built dirty looking place Joe's pod goes crashing into a window. Into your rundown apartment, apartment, continuous. The pod lands on the floor of a tiny room with only enough space to house a lazy boy recliner and a giant TV. Diz, mid-thirties fat ass sits sunken deep in the recliner. He watches TV. His jaw hanging open in a dull expression doesn't seem to register the pod that that just crashed through his window. Outside Diz's window, the dust storm and avalanche continue. He couldn't care less. From the TV, we hear an announcer with that testosterone heavy Fox style, but even dumber sounding. Next on the Violence Channel, an all new episode of Ow, My Falls. Yeah. Angle on TV, the TV sh- show begins. The main character, a frail, feeble looking man with a permanently worried look on his face, stands on a high rise balcony looking out the view. A big lumbering jaw comes up behind him and kicks him in the balls. Sending him over the balcony. Angle on Diz amused. 
<laughs> Angle on Joe's pod it starts to come to life. We hear fluids flowing. Lead lights come on. The pod displays a message unfreezing. Back on the TV, the show continues in rapid suge- suggestion. Succession. The main character falls off the balcony and lands on a on a high voltage wire on his balls. Gets slingshot off, start it, starts falling, heading straight for a fence, lands on his balls, then falls into someone's yard. A dog runs up, bites his balls. He scrambles over the high fence, falls down the other side, lands on a sawhorse, right on his balls, then finally falls on the ground. He stands up, brushes himself off, then notices something, a huge wrecking ball, swinging right towards his balls. Ah, he stands there like a deer caught in the headlights, then wham, right in the balls. We follow him through the air, his balls straddling the wrecking ball. Ow, my balls! Ow, my balls! Ow, my balls. <laughs> <laughs> Angle on the pod. Pod door is open. Joe leans up, cracks open his freezer, burned eyes. Looks around Daze. He's still in his military hospital outfit. Joe looks at Diz. He has no idea what he's looking at or where he is. He clutches his head in pain. Ugh. Diz, Diz's eyes remain glued to the TV, but he is momentarily distracted by Joe's noise. Joe rubs his eyes. Takes in his surroundings. He's completely disoriented. Nothing makes sense to him. Uh, Where is this, uh... Shut up! (laughs) (laughs) Joe looks at Diz, confused. Joe tries to get up, stumbles a couple of times, falls to the ground. Um, where's Officer Collins? Is this... Are we on the base? Irritated, Diz becomes hostile. I want to base your... Joe, groggy and half blinded, stumbles backwards in retreat. I, I'm sorry. I'm just. Where am I? Diz gets up angrily, revealing that the recliner is also a toilet. Pulls up his pants, flushes it, then walks over, grabs Joe, and throws him out the window. <sighs> Exterior city street continuous. Joe hits the ground hard. Joe gets up and painfully limps around. He looks across the street, sees something that makes him do a double take. Joe's POV, a cheerful TGIF looking restaurant. The sign reads, (laughs) but it's butt (laughs) fucker. The exact shape colors font of fun records. Joe looks up the sign to be at the kid's birthday party going on inside, back of the sign, and shakes his head. A guy and a girl walk by, each obese and wearing those t-shirts that make it look like you're naked. Uh, ex- excuse me, could you read that sign for me? Read? What do I look like, a gay? The guy growls at Joe. Joe stumbles off, nearly getting run over by a broken down futuristic car being pulled by a team of dogs. The car is continually making that annoying dinging sound that they make when the door is open. Joe rubs his eyes in disbelief, then walks unsteadily holding his head. <sighs> I must be hallucinating. Exterior city street day. Joe stops near a group of guys. Joe wandered the streets desperate for help, but the English language had deteriorated into a hybrid of hillbilly, valley girl, insirity insirity slang, and various grunts. Joe was able to understand them, but when he spoke in his ordinary voice, he sounded pompous and gay to them. Joe asks for directions. The guys all laugh and make fun of him. Joe pleads. One of the guys freaks out and starts beating his chest and yelling incomprehensible obscenities. Joe runs away, then he notices something. Oh, thank God. Joe's point of view. A misspelled sign reads, Memor- <laughs> Mem- Memorial Hospital. <laughs> above it is a huge billboard which reads, Surgery with an, with an attitude, with a picture of Vin Diesel type in a scrub suit, holding a scalpel with an anti-authority, fuck you scowl. Joe just shakes his head and walks towards the entrance. Note, for the purpose of the script, the dialogue of people of 2974 will be written in normal English, but for the movie, a future dumbass accent and appropriate slang would be created, as described above. That's nice. In Dear Memorial Hospital, the same time, Joe walks through the waiting room. People are sprawled around with a variety of strange injuries. A fat guy tangled up trying to take off a sweatshirt who's violently struggling to free himself. A whole family with their hands all stuck in a big jar of food like it's a raccoon trap. Joe staggers up to what looks like a fast food counter. A dull, bored-looking counter woman is behind the counter wearing a uniform that's halfway between McDonald's and hospital wipes. 
Hi, uh, I was in this army experiment and I'm not feeling so good. I think I might be seeing things. <laughs> you see the counter woman looking down at a machine that looks like one of those cash registers at McDonald's where there are no words or numbers, just pictures, icons depicting various ailments. A picture of an elbow with pain lines coming out. A picture of a guy with a knife in his head making a frowny face. A guy's butt. A knee, etc. She glances up at Joe back at the keypad thinking hard. <sighs> Finally, her finger lands on a key with an icon of a guy shrugging. Looking bewildered, she presses it. Diagnostic male! Uh, go over there. Joe starts to leave, then turns around. Is there a drinking fountain? The woman just points over her shoulder. Joe walks up to the drinking fountain and hits the button. He starts to drink and then makes a confused, disturbed face. He pulls away from the fountain to reveal some fluorescent greenish Gatorade type liquid is being dispensed. On the side of the fountain is a logo that reads Rancha, the thirst mutilator. Joe stops a passing doctor. Excuse me, I think this is Gatorade or something. I'm just looking for some regular water. Water? You mean like in the toilet? What for? Just to, to drink. The doctor stares at him a beat. Then just starts laughing like an idiot and walks off. <laughs> Interior hospital diagnostic room later on. Joe is in line leading up to a uniformed technician running what looks like one of those auto-diagnostic machines from Jiffy Loop or an automated car wash. A sad-looking man pulls up his pants as the technician hits a button on the machine. You've got hepatitis! <laughs> the man looks shocked. He starts to break down. Hey, take it easy. Your illness is important to us. Joe steps out. The technician holds up three probes connected to the diagnostic machine. Okay, th <laughs> okay, this one goes in your mouth. Joe tentatively opens his mouth. The technician puts it in. This one's for your ear. The technician sticks a second probe in Joe's ear. And this one's for your, goes in your butt. <laughs> the technician hands Joe a third probe. Joe looks at the looks at it reluctantly, hesitates, and looks at the line of twenty people staring at him. Asshole! Joe unhappily puts the plug in his butt. Out of out of shot. Oh shit! Wait a, wait a second. The technician pulls out three plug plugs out and stupidly <laughs> the identical cables. Okay. Um, one goes in your no way. Um, uh, I just need I need a second. Joe. Joe tries to follow the one that was in his <laughs> three card Monty, but it's a lost cause. The technician stops showing the probes. Okay, yeah, this one goes in your mouth. Joe stops, stares in horror as the technician brings the probe closer <laughs> to his mouth. Joe hesitates. Come on, dumbass! Cut to your. <laughs> Into your hospital waiting room, Joe at the drinking fountain, furiously <laughs> rinsing and spitting. Into your <laughs> doctor's office later. Oh. <laughs> Joe sits waiting for the doctor. He sees a magazine on the doctor's desk. Hot naked chicks <laughs> in world report. Joe picks up the magazine. He sees the date on it, March 3rd, 2974. Weird misprint. Joe flips through it. He lands on an article. Economy be all <laughs> bad and shit. Inflation higher than a motherfucker. Another article. Dust storms kicking our ass. Another page. A picture of an impoverished man with the quote, I'm fucking hungry. The doctor enters. A big affable lunk holding several charts and co computer printouts. <clears throat> hey, uh, how's it going, man? Not so good. I think I'm hallucinating like crazy. I, I think it's the drugs these army guys put me on. It's kind of top secret, but if you could just get me well enough to get back to base. Uh, 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 uh kick ass. A anyway, I, I don't want to sound like a, a dick or, or nothing, but I, I looked at your charts, and it seems like you're fucked up. You talk like you're, you know, you talk, and, and, and you shit may be messed up too. What, what I, man, is, is get plenty of rest. What? I, I want a second opinion. Omnipal doesn't lie, man. But listen, there's plenty of guys like you out there living really kick-ass lives. My, my first wife was a fucking idiot, and she's a pilot. 
Okay, I'm going to another hospital. So that'll be six billion dollars. So if you can just sign this while I scan you. Wait, six billion? What? The doctor takes Joe's wrist as Joe reads the invoice. Joe notices the date. March 3rd, 2974. That's funny. That's the exact same misprint as that magazine over there. What are the odds of... Joe trails off. His eyes go wide. Joe's point of view. The date on the magazine. The date on the invoice. The date on the doctor's desk calendar. Suddenly, it all comes together. Oh my god! As Joe starts freaking out, the doctor notices he doesn't have a UPC tattoo. Where's your two? The doctor reacts by shrieking like a monkey and flailing his arms. <laughs> Joe and the doctor are feeding off each other's mutual freakouts. They're unscannable. Huh? The doctor hits a button on his desk. A loud alarm goes off. Wait a minute, you don't understand. Unscannable. I need to talk to someone in the army. Oh, wait a minute, they're all dead. Everyone I know is dead. Oh, God, and Sharon, I stood her up by a thousand years. More alarms start going off. We hear more people in the hospital start screaming, unscannable. Joe takes off running out of the building. Begin montage. Exterior city street day. Joe wanders the street, still freaked out. He stops in front of a Radio Shack type store and looks through a window at a display of futuristic TVs. We pan across the TVs, each one with a network logo in the corner. The first is the Violence Channel, featuring two butterbean looking guys hitting each other. Then the Masturbation Network, featuring two topless women. And finally Fox. Featuring two topless women hitting each other. Joe just stares, bewildered. Exterior movie theater. Joe starts up at a big stark marquee with the word ass in the middle of it. Underneath it, it says, number one movie in America. Interior movie theater. On the screen, it is, is nothing more than a man's ass. Full screen farting every ten seconds or so. We pan across an audience of scary Neanderthal people laughing like baboons and stuffing their faces with greasy popcorn to find Joe sitting alone, horrified. Exterior cathedral. Joe lifts up the steps and opens the grand door. Interior cathedral. In a wrestling ring at the altar, a steroid, steroided out guy in a J Jesus wrestling outfit is doing an incredibly violent wrestling move on a guy in a devil outfit. The congregation goes nuts as the devil's manager grabs a folding chair and starts sneaking up on the victorious Jesus. Joe backs away, freaked out. Exterior street night. Tighten on Joe, tight on Joe's frightened and confused face. Joe notices something across the street. It's the Golden Arches. He walks over. Inte exterior, big McDonald's looking vending machine. Continuous. A woman and her four hungry kids in front of the ugly futuristic vending machine. Under the Golden Arches is written, Powered by OmniPow. The woman is getting frustrated, hitting a screen and waving the UPC tattoo on her wrist in front of it. The computer voice, the voice of the omnipresent OmniPow network, has that annoying Sprint PCS AOL, you've got mail voice, disjointed and booming with cheery enthusiasm when it's giving you bad news. Enjoy your cheeseburger. I don't know who woman is. It wasn't me. I just chimed no, in. I, I'm pretty sure it's you, but keep going. Yeah. Definitely wasn't me. Oh, it wasn't on the second thing, though. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, just be woman. You didn't give me no cheeseburger. I just got my an empty can. Would you like? Another cheeseburger. I didn't get any! Your account has been charged. You have no more money. Please come back when you can afford a purchase. <laughs> frustration. Note, the following line will be the computer's catchphrase, always delivered in the same condescending, enthusiastic manner of Robert Young in the old Maxwell Health decaf commercial. Hey, take it easy. Hey, take it easy. My children are starving and you took all my money! Your children are starving. OmniPal believes that no child should go hungry. You are an unfit mother, now notifying Child Protective Services. We hear a siren in the, in the distance. The woman and her four hungry kids take off running past Joe. Your children will be placed in the custody of McDonald's. Joe watches them run off concerned. Suddenly, there's a stampede of dumbass cops converging on the, the vending machine. One of the cops notices Joe. Hey, is that the unfit mother? Oh, he's an unscannable. That must be the one from the hospital. All right. Ten cops tackle Joe and handcuff him. Exterior street, moments later, Joe is led cuffed to a waiting police car. He struggles against his handcuffs. Passerby, laughing stupidly, watch the cop. Passerby, laughing stupidly, watch the cops drag him off. I can explain. I was in an army experiment. It's not my fault. 
angle on a cute little boy and his mom. The kid points at Joe. Mommy, the man talks all lame. Oh, he sure does. Interior police car, continuous. Joe's thrown in the back of a squad car. The car looks about 100 years more futuristic than today's cars, but everything looks busted and filthy. Out the window, <clears throat> Joe notices something on the street. Rita's empty pod. Hey, that's the other pod. Rita, she's alive. I gotta find her. The cop leans back and maces Joe. Joe, ah! howls. Joe howls. The cop slams the thick glass partition shut. As Joe claws at his eyes, the car begins speaking with the now familiar computer voice. Welcome to police custody. You have the right to error in 12. I'm sorry. Your operation has caused a fatal ACP error. Would you like to report this error? Would you like to report this error? Would you? No. Your operation has caused a fatal ACP error. Would you like to report? Fine, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, your request has caused a fatal bitstream error. Would you like to report this error? Finally, Joe snaps. Shut up! Hey, take it easy! Would you like to report this error? 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 Joe starts to thrash around as the car pulls away. Exterior street night. Rita wanders the street, disoriented, still waking up. She finds herself face to face with a guy who makes no attempt to hide his horniness, mumbling unintelligible come ons, looking her up and down. Aw, oh, yeah. Mm, girl, I could groove you real good. Rita shakes it off, keeps walking. The guy, undeterred, follows. Rita looks around at her crazy surroundings, trying to put things together. What the? Man, shit's changed in here. Where are those army guys? Mmm. Baby, I got an army in my pants. Rita ignores him, notices a futuristic payphone, and walks up to it. She looks at the phone, puzzled. It's still recognizable as a phone, but there's no keypad. She tentatively picks up the handset. Welcome to AOL Time Warner Starbucks U.S. Government Long Distance, powered by OmniPal. Please say the name of the party you wish to call. Uh, upgrade? Beat, as the hard drive clicks away. There are 9,726 listings for upgrade. Rita looks at the phone confused. Please deposit $2,000 to begin connection. $2,000? Where am I gonna get 2,000? The horny guy holds out a bunch of money, excited. Rita shakes her head, knowing what she has to do. Guess this shit didn't change all that much. Rita reluctantly takes the money. All right, hun. Uh, can you wait a sec while I make a call? Oh, yeah, baby, I can wait so good. Rita notices the guy's dumbass demeanor gets an idea. Oh, yeah? I like a man who can wait. Baby, I can wait a long time. Could you wait all day or wait a day? Baby, I can wait two days. Rita gains confidence. Okay. I charge by the hour. Oh, yeah, you're going to be glad you waited, baby. The horny guy smugly peels off a bunch of bills. Interior courtroom day. The courtroom is a mess. Like a rundown inner city public school classroom. There's a garbage there's garbage everywhere, graffiti. The flag is lying on the floor in a heap. An audience of rowdy spectators wait for the trial to begin. The crowd jeers as Joe is wheeled in a cage. A pumped up bailiff in tight in tights walks in the, in with a microphone. He whips up the crowd like an announcer at a wrestling match. Are you ready for ju some justice? Oh, it's, the yeah. crowd goes crazy. <clears throat> Woo! Yeah, because we got a lame talking moron who thinks we ought to pay his hospital bills. Do you want to pay his hospital bills? <laughs> no, no. Go get hit with a milkshake. I can't hear you. Hell no. Uh, no. Hell no. Judge enters. He is surprised and frightened by the noise of the courtroom. He bangs his gavel until everybody shuts up. When he speaks, he seems to be making up big sounding words as he goes along. He has the stupid confidence of a man who's never encountered anyone smart enough to correct him. Now, since y'all uh, say you ain't got no money, we have proprietarily obtained you one of them court appointed lawyers. Joe's lawyer enters. It's none other than Diz, the fat guy whose apartment is crashed in. He crashed into. You're my lawyer. Diz opens up a greasy paper bag, pulls out a bunch of crumbled, stained legal briefs. He looks them over. So, um, 
says here you robbed a hospital. Why'd you do that? I'm not guilty. He shakes his head. That that's not what the other lawyer said. What the other listen, you've got to put me on the stand. I can explain everything. We can take them to your house and show them the pot I came in. The judge starts banging his gavel. Y'all shut up now. I'm fixing to commensurate this trial here. Everyone shuts up. Okay then. We're gonna utilize the process of deliberation, examining the various puppetudes of this individual and see if we can't come up with us a verdict up in here. Now, why you think he done it? The prosecutor stands. He has a stone surfer accent. He's wearing a t-shirt that reads, lawyers do it in front of a judge. Okay, number one, your honor. Just look at him. The whole courtroom boos and laughs. Ooh. And be, we've got all this evidence about, like, this guy, like, didn't pay at the hospital, okay? Like, six billion dollars. And, and I heard that doesn't even have his tattoo. And, and I'm all, you gotta be shitting me. But check it out, man. Judge should be, like, guilty. Peace. The prosecutor sits down, proud of himself, as the crowd starts clapping. Joe looks around at everyone clapping and shouting at him. Please, let me explain what happened. Diz stands indignantly and slams his fist down on the table. Objection! The court quiets down. Everyone looks at Diz. Joe is pleasantly surprised. A beat? What are you objectifying on? Diz looks unsure for a moment. Uh, look, come on, just put me on the stand. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Your Honor, I object that this guy also broke my apartment what yeah, your honor i and i object that he's not gonna have any money to pay me after he pays all the money he stole from the hospital don't say i stole you're my lawyer <laughs> and and i object that he interrupted me when i was watching out my ball this is the last straw for the crowd they start throwing junk at joe joe stands <laughs> uh, okay uh your honor i think we have a, a mistrial or something well, up your ass and you'll shut up. Everyone, including the judge, cracks up. The court is filled with gales of big, stupid laughter. Please listen. Please listen. The court cracks up again. Diz leans over and high fives the prosecutor. I didn't steal anything. I was part of an army experiment hundreds of years ago. Something must have been wrong. There was a girl, too. The crowd starts shouting Joe down. The judge scribbles some notes on a computerized Omnipal tablet and frowns at the results. Then he bangs on his gavel until he has silence. All right, easy, everyone. Now, this cystified individual makes a bunch of good points, but the uh, allegationisms of uh, what transgressed at that particular time, so I believe... Joe hangs on every on the judge's every word. Hmm. A long, tense beat. The judge thinks. The court leans forward. Joe's future hangs in the balance. Hmm. The judge stands. He paces, thinking intensely. He stops his back to the court. My verdict. The judge drops his pants. Angle on judge's ass. Guilty is scrolled across it. The crowd explodes. Joe miserably bangs his head on the table. He's going to prison. <laughs> Joe, miserable, looks at the screaming crowd. Bailiffs grab Joe roughly and haul him off. Interior government building day. Joe is in, a li is in line with his police escort. Various other people are in various lines getting passports, driver's license, etc. What are we doing here? Getting your tattoo. Joe is led by a leash to what looks like a big ATM with computer terminal mounted on it. It says OmniPal, Easy ID, on it. Welcome to the Identity Processing Program of America. Please insert your arm in the arm receptacle. Joe slides his arm into a hole in the machine. His arm disappears into the machine up to his elbow. We hear the machine tighten its grip on Joe like a blood pressure machine. He isn't going anywhere. Thank you. Please speak your name as it appears on your current federal identity card. Document to 
four, G, three. Joe looks totally puzzled. I I'm not sure if I have an identity card, but my name is... You have entered the name, not sure. Is this correct? Not sure? What? No, it's not correct. Thank you. Not is correct. Is sure correct? What? No, no, it's not. Go back. Cancel. You've got the wrong name. My name is Joe Bowers. Not not sure. You have already confirmed your first name is not. Please confirm your last name, sure. No, my last name is not sure. I mean, no, wait. Thank you, not sure. Your confirmation is complete. Please wait a minute while I tattoo your new identity on your arm. Panicked, Joe tries to yank his arm out of the machine. It won't budge. No, stop. Give me my arm back. Hey, take it easy. The machine begins tattooing Joe's arm. It's very painful. We hear loud buzzing sounds. Joe tries to pull his hand out to no avail. Angle on monitor. The progress bar indicates Joe's tattoo is almost done. As Joe screams and fumbles the computer with his free hand, a camera flash goes off. We see a picture of Joe's face twisted in anger on the monitor with sure not printed along with his height, eye color, fingerprints, etc. Like a driver's license. Thank you, not sure. Your identification file is now complete. Exterior government building later. Another bland federal building. Come on, gotta get your IQ and aptitude tests. Four. Four. To figure out what your aptitude is good at and get you your jail job. Interior government building later. Rows of people are sitting at testing stations wearing headphones. They're doing dumb little tests like putting pegs into holes, matching colored blocks, touching their noses, etc. Joe is sitting at one of the testing stations wearing a pair of headphones. Next to him, a guy is furiously trying to jam a round peg into a square hole. We hear the voice coming from Joe's headphones. If you have one bucket that holds two gallons and another bucket that holds five gallons, how many buckets do you have? Joe looks confused, like it shouldn't be that easy, then leans towards the microphone. Two? Into your paddy wagon, day of moving. Joe sits in a bus full of, sca of the scariest degenerates you've ever seen. Exterior prison yard later. The prisoners are headed off the bus and into the prison. Interior prison check-in day. Check-in day. Joe is shoved into a room where prison guards are preparing new inmates for life in prison. They're taking their clothes, giving them uniforms, and sending them into various lines. Maximum security, minimum security, parole. Two? Joe holds out his hand. The guard scans it. Over there. The guard shoves Joe toward one of the lines. Joe's point of view. Out in the prison exercise yard, a scary, angry 400-pound man is sitting naked on the ground. His, hor his horrible folds of fat cover up what we can only assume are the world's most disgusting genitals. A closer look reveals that he is actually sitting on the face of some poor bastard trapped beneath him. The trapped man's legs kick futilely. Futilely. Joe stares in disbelief at this horrific image. The man catches Joe looking, points to the guys below him, and clearly mouths, You're next. Joe recoils. Joe is now at the front of the line, looking panicked. He's about to, set he's about to be sent off to lockdown. Desperate and terrified, he gets an idea. Uh, actually, I'm getting out of prison today. A beat. The guard just stares at Joe, trying hard to process this, then smacks Joe upside the head. <laughs> you're in the wrong line, dumbass. Yeah, I'm a big dumbass, sorry. The guard grabs Joe, buzzes him through a security gate, then shoves him into the parole line. A third guard scans Joe's UPC and checks his computer terminal. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't see you in here, so you're gonna have to, uh, uh, stay in prison. Could you check again? Because I was, like, definitely in prison. That guy sat on my face and everything. The guard looks off, then looks down at his terminal, get, uh, getting confused. The guard concentrates very hard, looking for Joe's name. After a beat, Joe takes off running. Everyone just watches him go. Alarms start going off like crazy. Everyone just keeps standing around. The guards look confused and frightened. Exterior city streets, moments later, Joe's running as fast as he ever has. He seems to have put some distance between himself and the cops. But as he runs past some kind of vending machine, we see an infrared beam si silently scan his UPC. His two. Exterior city street later, Joe stops for a moment, totally out of breath. He looks up and recognizes a familiar billboard, the Carlton cigarettes ad. He then notices his pod through the broken window of Diz's apartment. Interior Diz's apartment continuous. 
Jesus is, sit is sitting in front of the TV in his lazy job, eating marshmallowy goop with his hands from a giant tub labeled food. You're watching the Masturbation Network, America's number one network for 300 years. Angle on Diz's face. The TV starts pumping out some primitive boot knock and jam. Diz settles in, gets comfortable. The mood is broken by a loud knock on the door. Go away! Baiting! The knocking keeps going. Diz gets up, not happy, and opens the door. Joe runs in, slams the door, and pulls down the shades. He looks around, totally paranoid. Get out of here. No way. You just let me, an innocent man, get thrown into jail. You broke my house. Yeah, well, I can have you disbarred. Then maybe you'd go to jail for not having money. This looks scared. Really? Okay, look, you're the only person I know. You gotta help me. So, what do you want me to do? Well, I've been thinking. It's been a thousand years. Someone's got to have invented a way to travel back in time by now. I, I mean, I think they were pretty close even back in my day. Something with Einstein or something. Huh? You know, like a time machine. Uh... Joe looks around from Diz's slack face to the tub of food to the TV. He slumps against the wall. I guess that was too much to hope for. Uh, no, they got, they got a time machine. They do? Are you sure? Can it take me back to 2003? Yeah, but it's, it's like really expensive and it breaks all the time because some guy made it a long time ago. I don't care. You gotta take me there. Look, I supersize with you, but didn't you go to jail for not having any money? Joe is stumped. Then a brainstorm. Okay, how about this? You get me to the time machine, and when I get back home, I open a savings account in your name. A thousand years later, it'll be worth billions. This stares at Joe blankly. Because of the interest, you'll have billions of dollars. I like money. How many billion? Uh, uh, like 10. Time machine costs 20. Okay, then 30. 30 billion dollars. Just choose the, just choose it over. If I had 30, and time machine costs 20, what's the minus of 20 and 30? It's, uh, well, that's 80 billion dollars, Diz. That's a mighty big minus, isn't it? Yeah, I, I like money. There's a knock at the door. Police, open the door. We're looking for an escaped individual. Goes by the name, not sure. Diz looks at Joe, then at the door, unsure what to do. 80 billion. A beat. He's, uh, somewhere else. Coke machine in the vicinity caught this tattoo. Seems to be heading for this domicile uh you can't come in get to the cops start smashing down the door Diz and joe look at the broken window go get my money the two of them jump out the window just as the cops kick the door in exterior Diz's apartment night Diz and joe land hard on the street and run towards Diz's car they get in the car Diz starts it up okay there's just one more thing we got to go find this girl first um, is she hot? Uh, yeah, actually, she's not bad, but... Because that really wasn't part of the deal. A cop jumps out of the window and starts running towards the car. Okay, I'll throw in another ten billion, just go! Diz hits the gas, they peel out. Exterior street, moments later. Diz's electric car turns a corner, we hear sirens appro approaching in the distance. Okay, her pod is up here on the right, so she shouldn't be too far away. I hope. Exterior, another street, same time. Horny guy negotiates with Rita. So, when are we going to do it? Because you said $10,000 $10, an hour, and it's been like three days. Oh, yeah, soon, baby, soon, baby. Why don't you come back tomorrow? The guy peels off a bunch of other $10,000 bills. Yeah, yeah, baby, because when I finally utilize you, you're going to be paying me. The guy leaves. And you're still off the clock. As his car comes around a corner, Joe calls out. Rita, it, it's me, Joe. Uh-uh. Oh, yeah, what? Get in the car, quick. What the hell's going on anyway? What happened to- Police sirens get louder. I'll explain everything later, just get in the car. 
Reed jumps in the car and Diz takes off. Interior Diz's car continuous. Diz takes off as fast as he can. The siren gets louder. Rita notices as the cops turn the corner, now only a block away. Wait a minute. You've got the cops after you? Yeah. How do you even get in the car? I got two strikes, asshole! I'm just trying to help you. Help me? What'd you do to get the cops after you? You robbed a hospital. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah, and he also escaped from jail. Cops are gaining on them. Come on, step on the gas, Diz. What's gas? Just go faster. Suddenly, another huge dust storm blows in, completely obscuring their view. Diz turns a corner and manages to lose the cops and all the dust. Interior Diz's car later. The dust clears. Diz's, Diz's electric car putters through the city streets. We hear sirens fade in the distance. Joe looks around cautiously as Rita freaks out in the back seat. It's been a thousand years? Oh, upgrade's gonna kill me! He gets mad when I'm a day late with his money! Your, your boyfriend? He's sort of my manager, too. Well, if you owed him money, you don't have to worry, Rita. He's been dead hundreds of years. But she said there's a time machine! I yeah, there's a time machine, but not back then. You don't know Upgrade! Upgrade! You don't care about the time machine! It is now, then, last week, you'll find a way to come get me! I, I don't think you understand. Rita pulls a wad of bills out of her bra. I promised him I'd only be gone a year! I've got to get this back to him! Joe picks up the money and looks at it. The $10,000 bill looks like a garish, over-detailed uh, over masterpiece album cover. In the center is a long-haired former president with his arms around two bikini girls, a 40 in each hand, and a giant dollar sign gold necklace. The area's slogans are plastered around. 10000 bucks. That's what I'm talking about. Getting paid, hauling ass. I'm not sure this money is going to be good back in 2003. Rita laughs knowingly, snatches the money back. I'll let you tell that to upgrade. Damn, a thousand years, what happened? I don't know. Maybe they just forgot about us. Yeah. Joe just shakes his head sadly. Everyone must have forgotten about us. That's bad, man. Really supersized with you. Joe leans his arm out the window. Angle on Joe's tattoo as they pass an ATM machine. A light scan scans across Joe's UPC tattoo. Diz's dashboard computer comes to life is Jeter. You are harboring a fugitive by the name of Not Sure. Joe's mugshot appears on the monitor. Please pull over and wait for the police to incarcerate your passenger. Thank you for your help. The car starts to slow down. What are you doing? It shut off my battery. Exterior street night. Diz, Joe, and Rita abandon the stalled car and take off running across the street, across the street towards the first place they see, a fancy nightclub. Come on, we, we can hide in here. Joe, Rita, and Diz try to blend into the line leading into the club. Inside, futuristically hip people are dancing and having a great time. As the line moves forward, we see it leads up to a robo-bouncer, powered by Omnipound. He scans each person's UPC and looks them up and down before admitting them into the club. The robo-bouncer scans a guy's hand. It speaks in the same familiar computer voice. You are too poor and ugly to enter. The guy shuffles off. The bouncer scans a girl's hand. You are too flat-chested to enter. The girl looks shocked and hurt. Hey, take it easy. Joe, Diz, and Rita are next in line. Joe puts out his hand, then realizes, and tries to pull it back. Oh, shit, what am I doing? You are too wanted by the police. Please wait here for incarceration. They take off running. Down the street, Joe, Rita, Diz hear a big noise. They turn and look, and look down the street in horror as the police converge on Diz's car and start blasting away at it with guns. The cops, dumb-looking and incredibly well-armed, are totally indiscriminate. Shoulder-mounted missiles are straying into the apartment buildings, etc. One cop has his shoulder-mounted missile on backwards. It fires out the back, goes straight up. After a beat, a plane crashes in the background. People get excited by the violence. They start cheering the cops on. Random fights start breaking out. Joe, Rita, and Diz run for their lives. They manage to put out a couple blocks between them and the police. Exterior street, sunrise. They round a corner, haggard. They're under a badly designed, unfinished freeway overpass. Way too many levels, piles of unused hardened concrete, etc. How much further is it? Uh, a few miles, I think. Rita sags. Joe leans against the side of a pillar, of a pillar, rubbing his head, squinting at the early morning sun. Oh man, I'm still groggy. A thousand years of sleep? I could really go for a Starbucks. 
Yeah, I don't think we got time for a hand job right now. Joe and Rita look at each other confused. Anyway, Walmart's up here. They they got a shuttle that'll take us right near the time machine. Diz points to mind bogglingly gigantic Walmart surrounded by a shanty town of homeless people. Joe and Diz take off running towards the Walmart. Exterior Walmart moments later. Joe, Diz, and Rita make their way towards the front gate. As they get there, they see 20 cops pull up. They quickly try to disappear into the crowd of beggars. Joe and Diz push through the mob of starving homeless people clamoring to get in. I can't let them see my tattoo, so you pay for us, okay? Um, uh, okay. Diz runs his hand over a scanner next to the front entrance. Three. Is Jeter. You are harboring a fugitive today. Are you still harboring a fugitive? Diz looks around nervous. Say no. Uh, no. Thank you. Do you know the whereabouts of fugitive? Not sure. Uh, no. Thank you. Three enter through the automatic revolving doors. As they exit, a feeble elderly lady approaches the entrance on her walker. She can't. She scans her UPC. Velveeta Jordan, have you seen any dangerous criminals in the vicinity? Well, uh, I'm not sure. Thank you. You are not sure. You are a wanted criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly the revolving door clamps shut, trapping Velveeta inside. Please stay away from the criminal while I notify authorities. Sorry for the inconvenience. The frightened old woman starts banging on the glass. We hold on the revolving door as several cops hack it open with axes. Yeah, we got him. The cops grab Velveeta, rough, roughly throw her to the ground, and hogtie her. Interior Walmart, main room. Joe, Rita, and Diz walk into a huge marketplace. It stretches the length of several football fields. It has everything from TVs to herds of goats. It is lit mostly by a huge rotted out hole in the ceiling. They jog by the greeter on their way to the main shopping area. Welcome to Walmart. I love you. Um, thanks. Welcome to Walmart. I love you. Welcome to Walmart. I love you. So, bus is over near electronics. It's about a uh, half a mile from here. Into your Walmart later. Joe, Reed, and Diz are still running through Walmart. You see many shops within shops. They pass a yogurt my ass franchise. <laughs> Starbucks exotic coffee for men with a lot of guys at the door. A sign reads latte, $2,000. Extra foam, $500 million. Scantily clad baristas help customers. Diz slows down out of breath. We've been running forever. How much further is it? About uh, half a mile. That's what you said an hour ago. Are you sure you know where we're going? Yeah, I know this place pretty good. I went to law school here. In Walmart? Yep, got a fart scholarship. I'm sorry, a, a what? Fart scholarship. Took the fart team to Nationals in 68. Of course, that was when I was in shape. I'm gonna slow down. They slow to a walk. Interior Walmart a little later. Joe, Rita, and Diz walk through a huge appliance area. Why do you guys want to go back so bad? When I say in history in school, they said the past was stupid. Well, maybe it was, but at least I wasn't wanted by the police. I also had a pension coming and a pretty nice girlfriend who probably died thinking I stood her up. Well, I got no choice. Upgrade's gonna be so pissed off I don't get back. Rita, I'm not sure you understand this completely. No, I don't think you understand. Interior Walmart, shuttle stop day. They arrive at the shuttle stop. Shuttle comes every few minutes. It shouldn't be too long. I have to use the bathroom. She starts laughing stupidly. Rita rolls her eyes. I'll be right back. Rita leaves, back in the direction they came from. Joe and Diz wait. Diz checks her out. Oh, she's hot. You might, you mind if I hit that? I like having sex with chicks. I think everyone does, Diz. Yeah, but I like it a lot. <laughs> Joe looks on, kind of disturbed as Diz breaks into a weird booty dance, making an embarrassing primitive sex face. Oh, yeah. The dance goes on. A couple beats beyond what is funny. People start to look. Look, Diz, cut it out. You're going to get us caught. As Joe waves his hand trying to get Diz to stop, we see a TV in the furniture section scan Joe's TV tattoo. 
all the TVs come to life. Warning! Omnipal has detected a dangerous fugitive near Walmart shuttle stop 5C. Damn it! Come on, let's get Rita. Joe and Diz take off towards Rita, but then they see cop cars indoors, heading from the <laughs> indoors, heading from the direction straight for them, blocking their path to the bathroom. They stop. Shuttle pulls out. The door's open. Joe takes a step towards the shuttle, then stops. Damn it, what do we do now? We can't just leave her here. On all the TVs in the furniture section, the bad picture of Joe from the ID machine appears. The fugitive goes by the name Not Sure and is described as weird. Free Starbucks gift certificate to whoever apprehends them. Suddenly, one hundreds, hundreds of guys snap to attention and start looking all over him. Joe keeps his head down, trying not to be noticed. The shuttle is about to leave as the last few people get on. Joe is torn. Damn. If we go get her, it's suicide. But if we wait for her, we miss the shuttle and I'm busted for sure. Wait, I know. How about we go to the time machine? Then when I get back to the past, I could just tell Rita not to do the experiment. Then she won't even be here. That'll work, right? He stares at Joe, looking like he's about to have a mental hernia, trying to wrap his mind around this. But wait a minute, she's here, so that means I didn't go back in time. Uh... Sirens get lo closer. A guy recognizes Joe and starts yelling. Okay, no, wait, I just haven't done it yet, right? So I'll go back, tell her not to do the experiment, and I won't have to do it either. Because I won't have to come here and rescue her if she's not... Now, wait a second. Uh... C cops. We now see the cop cars closing in. But... But wait, maybe I already did go back and told her not to do it, and she disappeared. But I just didn't see it. But then what am I still doing here? Did I come back for another? A at any point, did you notice two of me? Joe clutches his head, collapsing under the weight of the concept as the sirens converge. Damn it, how does this time travel work? The, sh the shuttle leaves. The cops pile out of their cars. Joe and Diz start to run, but it's no use. The cops grab Joe and throw him into the back of a squad car. Joe calls out desperately, Rita! Diz presents more of a problem to the cops. He tries to get under to get under a nearby cop car rolling around in the dirt, totally undignified. The, cop, the cops drag him out and throw him in a different car. Angle on the women's bathroom. Rita comes out just in time to see the cop cars pulling away with Joe and Diz. She watches, a little scared. A cop starts to glance her, glance her way. Before he can see her, she ducks behind a couch. Interior squad car. Joe's in the back seat. Two cops sit up front. Can I just... That's enough of your bullshit, sir. One of the cops leans over and casually maces Joe. He recoils. Rubbing his eyes and screaming in pain. Uh -huh. All right, says says here we're supposed to take this alleged individual to the White House. Huh? Yeah, it says the president wants to see him. Joe barely manages to crack his burned eyes open in surprise. The, the president? The cop brandishes the mace. Sir, I'm not going to tell you again. Joe flinches. Exterior of the White House. The same White House, but with graffiti all over it. Casino attached, a bunch of junk cars on the grass, and a presidential limo up on blocks. A bunch of girls in bikinis lay out in the yard. The cop car pulls up. Exterior street day, Rita walks out of the Walmart. She stops a passing guy. Excuse me, could you tell me where uh, the time machine is? The guy looks her up and down. Maybe I got a time machine in my pants. Great. Rita keeps walking. The guy calls out to her. Yeah, baby, and it's even bigger than the one at the science center. Science center? Into your Oval Office, Joe is shoved roughly into the room. There are three cabinet members. Attorney General, uh, China type. Secretary of Defense, a Hispanic bouncer-looking guy, and Secretary of State, a 14-year-old boy. They all wear shorts and outfits. Thank you. Uh, that look like Walmart Halloween costumes with themes based on their jobs. Wait a minute. I'm the smartest guy in the world? Says who? That IQ, that IQ test you took in prison, you got the high score in history. Yeah, dumbass. That's, that's how come President Camacho is making you Secretary of Interior because you're so smart. I'm the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and she's an Attorney General. Look, this has got to be some kind of mistake. That test was too easy. I am not the smartest guy in the world. 
Joe takes in the dull faces of the cabinet members. Diz, the cops, the official oil portrait of the current president on the wall with a bad haircut and a Captain America looking outfit making a stupid heavy metal face. Okay, even if that's true, I can't be Secretary of Interior. I don't even know what that is. The cop advances on Joe, brandishing his mace. Sir, I'm not going to tell you again. A Secret Service guy wearing only black tights, sunglasses, and an earpiece grabs the cop and does an atomic pile driver on him. Joe backs away, shaken. President Camacho enters with a couple of groupies. He whispers to them to wait outside. Something about having to take care of some business, baby. They, they take off his coat, a la James Brown. Wait outside, gotta take care of some business, baby. So where's my new Secretary of Interior? Everyone points to Joe. Camacho walks over to Joe, towering over him. So you're smart, huh? Thought your head would be bigger. The deposed former Secretary of Interior enters, furious. He's built like a bouncer. Where is he? Where is the little pencil dick that took my job? Is that him? The former secretary rips off his shirt and charges at Joe. Secret service agents restrain him with various wrestling holds. Joe, terrified, hops on a table, dodging the mass of bodies. The 14-year-old secretary of state starts crying. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't even want the job. The cop charges at Joe again. All right, that's it. You're going down. Secretary of Defense clotheslines the cop, causing him to mace former secretary full in the face. Former secretary <laughs> screams, flailing his huge arms. Former secretary blinded manages to throw off the Secret Service and comes at Joe. Former secretary falls on the table, smashing it and sending Joe to the ground. Camacho runs up and kicks former secretary in the gut. He goes down and stays down. Yeah. As the melee continues, Joe seizes the opportunity and makes a beeline for the door. Cop steps behind Joe and the exit brandishing a giant, scary looking gun. I can't let you do that, Secretary, not sure. The fight stops. Camacho cold cocks forward secretary for good measure. Look, I, I don't understand. I don't want to be Secretary of the Interior. Why are you making me? Because you're the smartest guy in the world. And we got all these problems that this asshole couldn't fix. Camacho kicks him again for good measure. What problems? All the crops be dying for some reason, and people are running out of food and shit, and there's all these dust storms that cause the garbage avalanche, and the common knees all bad and shit. Yeah, and it's really hurting me in the polls. But I don't know how to be a secretary of anything. I've never even voted. Well, you better start voting or whatever you gotta do to figure this shit out, because before I kick your smart balls all the way up to the roof of your smart mouth. Joe backs away scared. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. But seriously, you better solve that shit. If you solve it, I'll get you a full presidential pardon. If you don't, you're going back to prison. Camacho starts to leave, stops by the door. Watch him. He's smart. He's important, too. So, if he tries to leave, shoot him. Camacho leaves. The cabinet members all stare at Joe for a beat. Slack job. Do something smart. Uh... Well, I think it would be pretty smart if you guys could get my lawyer Diz here because, well, he's really good at figuring stuff out and stuff. Okay. Various cabinet members nod. And also there's this girl named Rita. You think you could bring her here too? Why? Uh, well, uh, you know... Cabinet members mistake his hesitation for innuendo, immediately getting the wrong idea. They start laughing like idiots and doing the finger hole gesture. <laughs> the 14 year old gets so excited, he busts out into an R. Kelly style song. They're not sure gonna utilize a girl named Rita. They're gonna be an intercourse in a sexual way. Joe goes along with it. Yeah, all right. So you can bring her here, right? Oh, yeah. But first. Joe joins in weekly. Mm -hmm. Interior House of Representatives, <laughs> Senate floor. <laughs> Night. Congress persons are having a ruckus. A, a ruckus. What's that ruckus? Good time greeting each other, slapping each other on the back, throwing gang signals, etc. Joe is escorted to a seat by his guards. The lights dim and the crowd falls into an excited hush. 
The room begins to fill with dry ice smoke. Strobe lights start flashing in time with heavy techno jock jam music, which leads into an all-out light show. Laker girl-looking dancers run out into the middle of this. The spotlight hits them and they start freaking each other in a way that skirts bad. That's bad taste. The president struts out, waving a towel over his head. After a few hell yes, he calms the crowd down and begins to read a speech off a teleprompter. Shit. Angle on the teleprompter. It reads, shit. It scrolls down. I know shit's. I know shit's bad right now with all that starving bullshit. But I got a solution. The crowd starts to get ugly. That's what you said last time, dipshit. I got a solution. You're a dick. South Carolina, what's up? The crowd cheers. People start firing guns in the air. <laughs> Hang on, Joe, looking terrified. Fed up. Prez. President Camacho reaches down and pulls out an even huger, scarier gun. Fires a couple warning shots in the air. The crowd quickly shuts up. That's what I thought. Now, I understand everyone shits emotional right now, but listen up. I got a three-point plan to fix everything. Number one, we got this guy not sure. Joe appears live on the Jumbotron. Number two, he's smarter than anyone in history. And number three, he's going to fix everything. I give you my word as president. The crowd starts to rally. Joe looks uneasy. He'll fix the starvation. And that ain't all. I give you my word, he's gonna fix the crops too. And I give you my word, he's gonna fix the dark storms. Angle on Jumbotron. Joe tries to interrupt, weakly raising a hand, but he's ignored. The crowd is eating this up. He's gonna fix the comedy. He's gonna fix the avalanches. He's gonna fix the problems with the cars. Ladies and gentlemen, the new Secretary of Interior, not sure. Yeah! Ooh, wild, start shooting guns in the air. <laughs> President Camacho, feeding off their enthusiasm, picks up his even huger gun and starts enthusiastically spraying the ceiling with bullets. The Jumbotron, with Joe's terrified face, gets hit with a bullet that explodes like that scene from The Natural. Interior tunnel, moments later. The crowd flies out, files out. Joe comes out, still surrounded by Secret Service guards. Diz is brought to him. Congratulations, man. I, had, I didn't know you were smart. Shit, they got me a room in the White House. Everyone gets laid in the White House. Joe leans into Diz. Look, I'm glad you're happy about it, but I brought you here because I need your help. I don't know what he's talking about. I can't solve all these problems. I, I want you to draw me a map to the time machine and leave it in my coat pocket. You got that? Uh... You still want that money, don't you? Oh, yeah. Man, if I had money and a room with a White House. Diz starts going into a filthy booty dance. And making vulgar noises. Joe stops it. Cut it out. I told everyone you were really smart, so act smart, okay? Smart? What do you mean, like, you? <laughs> Get me to the time machine so I can see my girlfriend. She thinks I stood her up. I don't sound like that. I don't sound like that. A guard turns around, kind of surprised. Shit, I thought there were two of you. <laughs> Exterior Science Center Day. It's similar to the Seattle Science Center. Kind of like a huge college campus, but for dumbasses. Rita looks for the time machine. She heads up some steps into what looks like it could be the Smithsonian. We pull out to reveal she's heading into the National Fart Museum. Interior National Fart Museum Day. Rita wanders through, looking for the time machine. There are dioramas of caveman hunting. T-Rex skeletons. <laughs> recreations of the Apollo moon landing. Abstract sculpture. All the displays have one thing in common. One continuous audio track of various parts. Rita passes a kindergarten class being led on a tour. Then up to a diorama featuring a life-size stuffed woolly mammoth. She sees a button down below the glass and pushes it. A long, low fart is heard. Rita shakes her head and keeps walking. Suddenly, she's grabbed by a bunch of Secret Service cops. What the hell? You're coming with us! Interior of, the, interior of the White House Oval Office the next day. Various cabinet members around the conference table. Diz is there too. Joe's led in by his guards. He's pushed into a chair a little more roughly than is necessary. Oh, good. He's here. So, so did you solve all the problems yet? Uh, well, no. The cabinet members are all stunned and annoyed. What? Why not? 
Well, I, I just got here yesterday. I've been in my room all night. The guards wouldn't let me go anywhere. Oh, man. President Camacho is definitely going to be pissed off. But what does he expect? It's going to take some time. I think he said one week. What? He did a press conference this morning and told everyone you'd have everything solved in one week. Starvation, crops, the economy, the economy, the, the dust storms, the garbage, avalanches, and a bunch of other stuff. Better get on that. It's, it's already been like four days. No, it hasn't. Well, that's what he told everyone. So you guys are saying I've got three days to solve all the country's problems. The starvation, the dust, the avalanches, or I go back to prison? Yeah. Overwhelmed, Joe clutches his head miserably, then gets an idea. Well, if I'm going to solve your starvation problem... Maybe I should have a look at some of these dying crops, especially the ones by the uh, Science Center. Into your White House hallway later, Joe's guards escort him to his room. A cop approaches. Mr. Secretary, you found that whore you wanted. Okay, maybe that's what you guys call women in the future, but... Uh... No, sir. It turns out you wanted for unlicensed whoring. Yeah, well, they arrested me for stealing. I wouldn't put too much faith in your legal system. She's an artist. Yeah, she's charged some guy a bunch of money and didn't put out... That could get her 10 years. Don't worry, though. We can get her a temporary whoring license as a, as long as you're doing her because you're government. They arrive outside Joe's room where the cops are waiting with Rita. Joe! It's not sure. It's not sure, ma'am. Secretary, not sure. Secretary? Secretary of what? Uh, would you guys mind if Rita and I talked in the room alone? Oh, really? Because we're kind of hoping we could all go family style on her. Uh, no thanks. I just like it, you know, regular. Oh. All right, we'll, we'll just listen then. Go ahead. Your White House better later. Rita sits on the bed. Joe paces. They talk in hushed tones. So, if neither of us can leave, how will we ever get to the time machine? The only way they'll let me go is if I solve all of their problems. The economy, world hunger, dust storms, garbage, abu I'm sorry, avalanches. So what are you going to do? I'm thinking we'll escape. Trust me, you don't want to go to jail here. Sounds good to me. Shouldn't be too hard to escape. Because I don't know if it's just me or what, but these future mass motherfuckers don't seem too bright. The guard yells from outside the door. Come on already. Joe lowers his I'm really sorry, but just so they don't get suspicious, maybe I should just, uh, well, here. Just sits on the bed, starts gently bouncing up and down, making a squeaking noise. Yeah, it's about time. By the way, don't worry, I'll sleep on the floor. You can have the bed. Joe keeps bouncing a little faster. Come on, you can do better than that. Don't make me come in there. Joe bounces a little faster and nervously improvises some lame sex noises. Uh, yeah, this is great. Rita rolls her eyes, pushes Joe out of the way, and takes charge, bouncing enthusiastically and improvising various filthy sounds. Joe ah! <laughs> walks away, impressed, turned on, and a little scared. Outside, we hear the guards cheer. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Exterior crops the next day. Joe, Rita, Diz, Joe's guards, and cabinet members stand at the edge of a huge futuristic wheat farm with automated watering systems, automated plows, etc. Joe looks on at the shriveled up dead plants, pestilence ravaged with flies and parasites buzzing everywhere. It's bleak. Boy, uh, yeah, that sucks. Joe discreetly looks down at his pocket, sees the folded map from Diz. Hey, uh, I need to go to the bathroom, and, uh, Rita does too. We'll just go behind those bushes, if that's okay. Oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> the cabinet all start laughing like idiots doing the juvenile finger-in-hole gesture. As Joe and Rita head across the, re the field to some bushes in a ravine, Rita and Joe reach a place where they can't be seen. Behind the bushes, Joe pulls the map out of his pocket and folds it. It's incredibly crude and useless like a three-year-old would draw. A big box in the corner says, Time Machine, M-A-S-H-E-E-N. There's no scale, directionals, or any other markings. Damn it. Way to go, Diz. <laughs> Joe throws it down in frustration. Maybe we should just make a run for it. Ask for directions. I don't think that's a good idea. We can't take any chances. My face was all over national TV. There's no way I'm going back to that jail. Joe has a quick flashback, like a Vietnam flashback, of the 400-pound guy sitting on the guy's face. Damn it. 
Okay, we'll go back. I'll get a better map. Next chance we get, we'll make a run for it. What if we don't get another chance? Oh, boy, I better find Upgrade before he finds me. Upgrade can't find you, okay? It's impossible. Oh, you think so? Let me tell you a story. I ran off to Buffalo once. Didn't tell no one where I was going. I check into a motel. The phone rings. Bam! It's Upgrade! Yeah, that was a thousand years ago. Just trust me. You're safe. You really think so? Yes. And I know it's none of my business, but when we get back, you and Upgrade should think about couples counseling, and maybe you should get an art manager who's not your boyfriend. Just then, the guards come running through the bushes into the ravine. Hey, you were supposed to be doing her. Uh, I was. We finished already. Are you, you sure? Yeah, yeah. He was great. Guard puts away his gun. All right, let's get back. They start heading back. Suddenly, the automated sprinkler system comes on. Joe looks at the drops on his arms, notices they're green. What is this? Is that Gatorade stuff? They look up and see a giant tank wa tank slash water tower with the Rancho logo. It says, Rancho's got what plants crave and with electrolyte. They're watering the plants with that shit? Joe looks around, sees acres and acres of crops being watered with Rancho. Rancho. Getting an idea. Interior White House conference room day. Joe meets with the cabinet members. He looks frustrated, like this has been going on a while. Once again, I'm pretty sure all that Rancho stuff might be what's killing the plants. But Rancho's got what plants crave. It's got electrolyte. Oh, wait a minute. You're saying you want us to put water on the crops. Water. Like out of the toilet. It doesn't have to be from the toilet, but yes, that's the idea. Okay. Well, Rancho's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. Look, your plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure the Rancho's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Well, Look, you want to solve this problem, I want to get my pardon. So why don't we try it and stop worrying about what plants crave? Rancho's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's like the commercial says. Plants work hard, and they need a drink that works hard. Oh, it, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Does anyone even know? They're what's in Rancho. But what are they? They're what they use to make Rancho. But why do they use them to make Rancho? Rancho's got electrolytes. All right, look, I'll prove it to you. Is there a library around here? Exterior library. <laughs> Exterior library of Congress Day. Establishing shot. Yes, it's spelled library. Interior library of Congress Day. Close up on Joe's astounded face. <laughs> He looks around in disbelief as we pull out to reveal that the library apparently contains nothing but miles and miles of pornography. The cabinet members and guards are there too. So all you have is pornography? Oh, they got other stuff. Cut to you, interior library of Congress stacks later. Secretary of Defense pulls a, a book off the shelf that says extreme science. <laughs> Joe opens it, we see a woman. <laughs> G-string seductively holding a DNA double helix model. He flips through it. It's all quasi-porn. Uh, do you have any older books? Cut to Interior Library Congress. Different section day. Secretary of Defense hands him a book called Horny Grandmother. No, that's not what I meant by older. <laughs> I need a book that was made a long time ago. <laughs> Cut to Interior Library of Congress, deep in the stacks day. Joe is poring over several ancient yellowed mildew books. He finds one that seems like seems like what he's looking for. Dissolved to Interior Library of Congress, reading area day. The cabinet members are all looking at issues of horny grandmas and moms who like to go. Joe comes running out excited. I figured it out. Electrolytes are salt. That's your problem. It's just like the dust bowl. 
It probably worked for a few decades, but now salt's building up in the topsoil. That's what's killing the plants. That's what's causing the dust storms, just like the Dust Bowl. Yeah, that's what we were saying. Ronto's got electrolytes. Just easy's not going to get anywhere. Okay, look, you're just going to have to trust me on this. You've got nothing to lose. Just switch all of the crops to water. Like from the toilet? Okay, fine. Yes, from the toilet. Wherever you get the water, send that to the crops. Okay. You don't have to get all weird at the lame attack on us. Hey, look, my grandma! <laughs> the 14-year-old proudly... <laughs> <laughs> Montage, various locations, crops, landscape sprinkler, sprinklers, lawns, etc. Sprinklers come on. The last spurts of rancho sputter out, and water begins flowing. It's to your White House Rose Garden day. Joe and the cabinet members stand before what was once the Rose Garden. Joe watches the cabinet members as the sprinklers change to water. Not working. Yeah, it is. That's water. I mean, the plants aren't growing. Well, like I told you, it's going to take a while, remember? President Camacho walks up with a few groupies. There's my boy. What's up? You got this problem solved? Well, yes, Mr. President, I think I do. It may take a while, but if everyone's patient, I'm pretty sure this will work. The crops will start growing. The dust storms will stop. The economy will get better. You just got to be patient. So about my pardon. Camacho gives him a big, overly aggressive bear hug. My man! Interior House of Representatives, <laughs> Camacho addresses Congress. Joe sits with Rita Diz and the cabinet members out on the floor as before. Today, I solved the biggest bummer in the history of America. How? Uh. <laughs> Remember when I hired Secretary Not Sure? He thought of a bunch of science involving, a uh, water and, a. Uh, Electrolytes. <laughs> the audience starts nodding, impressed, on board, when they hear electrolytes. And not sure it did that science to the plants. And so now, there will be crops. The problem is solved. Yeah. The crowd cheers. Joe appears live on the Jumbotron. Barry's congressman pat him on the back. Congratulatory. And all that other stuff will stop too, like the dust storms, the starvation, the ambulances, the comedy. He pauses for the crowd to cheer. And I'm gonna be up in the polls. And I'm gonna get him in, <laughs> and I'm gonna be getting my poll up. You know what I'm talking about? My poll. Everyone cheers like crazy as President Camacho grabs his crotch. Angle on Joe, looking a little uneasy. He leans over to the attorney general. So, uh, he seems pretty happy. Do you think I could get my pardon now? Yeah, Camacho said you could get it as soon as the crops grow. That way, they can lock your ass down if your plan doesn't work. He's a good movidator. Worried, Joe looks out and sees Congressman doing some filthy air booty spank dance, chanting crops. Into your White House, bedroom night. Joe looks out the window at the dead rose garden as Rita lies on the bed. Wow. If this works, I really did save the country. I've never done anything like that before. Sweet. I hope something grows fast. I don't want to wait too long for that pardon. Well, we can always try to make another run for the time machine. Yeah, I'll get Diz working on a better map tomorrow. Joe goes over and sits in a chair. To tell you the truth, I'm not in such a big hurry to get back to Upgrade anyway. And I'm not sure if it's the drugs they gave us in that experiment or what, but I kind of feel like I'm smarter than most of these people. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's kind of a good feeling. You think Einstein walked around thinking everyone was a bunch of dumb, dumb shits? I, I never thought of it that way. Now I know why he built that bomb. Joe lies down on the floor. You know you don't have to sleep on the floor. I won't bite. Joe is caught off guard. A bit awkward. Oh, th that's okay. I wouldn't want to get you in trouble with upgrades sleeping with some stranger. Rita can't <laughs> help herself. She starts laughing. 
Joan nervously joins in. <laughs> well, if you change your mind, it's better than the floor. Into your White House bedroom morning. Joe wakes up, goes over the window, and looks out at the rose garden. Nothing is growing yet. The sprinklers are on the with are on with water, but it still looks barren. He looks a little worried. Shit. In your White House hallway later. Joe's guards lead him to a conference room. He runs into Diz walking the opposite way with a chick on each arm. Hey, man, these chicks have never seen the inside of the White House. Ladies, is the secretary not sure? Oh, I saw you on TV. Oh, yeah. Hey, Diz, can I talk to you a second? Excuse me a second. This is uh, top secret technical crop stuff. Joe pulls Diz to the side, talks quietly. Diz, you need to draw me a better map. Draw? I got it off of OmniPal MapSmart. Well, get a better one, or just get me the address, quick. I'm kind of busy with these chicks. The money, Diz, remember? Oh, yeah. All right, I can do them fast. Diz walks towards the ladies, undressing as he goes. Joe <laughs> turns away in disgust. The cabinet members come running up to Joe in panic. Shit! I'll shoot broken Liz! We got the CEO of Rancho on the phone, and he's pissed off. Come here, quick. Into your White House conference room moments later, Joe and the cabinet members are gathered around a video phone talking to the CEO of, of Rancho, who's in his office, panicking. We hear people riding outside his building and occasionally bottles and debris hit his window. What happened? Uh, well, we switched the crops to water. We're not talking about that. Our, sa our, our sales are, like, down. Way down. The stock went to zero and the computer did auto layoff on everyone. Shit. Almost everyone in the country works for Rancho. Not anymore. And the computer said that everyone owes Rancho money. Everyone's bank account is zero now. I think that makes the economy suck. What are we going to do? She's going crazy. He ducks as a bottle from the angry mob shatters the window. Okay, uh, why don't you just hire everyone back? I can't. The computer won't let me. Can't you shut the computer off? No, I got laid off too. My password doesn't work. Why is this happening? Well, it's probably because we switched to water, but... You mean this is your fault? Yeah, all this shit started when you switched to water. Look, don't worry. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Huh? We hear another angry mob, this time outside the White House. Joe looks out the window and sees the mob gathering, yelling and throwing stuff. Uh, I have to go to the bathroom. Joe casually steps out the room. In the hallway, as soon as he's out, Joe takes off running. Into your White House bedroom moments later, Joe runs in, finds Rita. We gotta get out of here right now. What's wrong? Joe pulls open the curtain, revealing the angry mob, yelling and throwing bottles. <sighs> oh my god. I knew it. This is what happens when I try to fix something. Camacho bursts in with guards. There he is. Get him! To the guards grab him and throw handcuffs on him. Wait, I was just trying to help. It's going to take time. Save your smart man double talk brain tricks for the judge. Judge? Oh no, not another trial. Oh yeah, you're going to the extreme court. Begin news montage. Fox News. Oh, uh, TV full screen. We're watching the news on the Violence Channel. A Violence Channel news graphic comes on. A female newscaster with an amazing hairdo at a news desk. An image of Joe behind her. She is straining to sound smart. He tried to take water from toilets, but it's not sure who finds himself in the toilet now. <laughs> and as history pulls down its pants and prepares to lower its ass on not sure's head, it's Daddy Justice that will be crapping on him this time. We now go live to the Violence Channel correspondent... <laughs> Jafet Rivera at the Rancho shareholders meeting where all the shit has broken loose. Interior Rancho head HQ stockholders meeting. <clears throat> a male reporter stands in front of the camera. He's a Geraldo type, like a war correspondent who's enjoying the mayhem a little too much. Behind him, stockholders yelling, throwing stuff. The Rancho CEO is at a podium trying in vain to maintain order. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. What you see behind me, kick ass. As you can see, these people want answers and whoa. A full-on brawl breaks out and starts spreading throughout the whole room. The reporter watches, getting excited. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Kick his ass. 
The reporter can't help himself. He drops the microphone and joins in the fight, wailing on the first person he sees. Back on the female anchor. Thank you, Jafet. Kick ass! We'll see more of that action later. A bad picture of Not Sure comes on. With us now to discuss the trial of Secretary Not Sure is one of the most important celebrities of our times, the star of Ow, My Balls! Welcome, Bob Nyquil! In a wider shot, we see the star of Oh My Balls sitting across the table from her, a la R.I.P. Larry King. Thank you. Thank you, June. Uh, you know, it's, it really hurts me to see what's going on. Uh, he said he'd make the crops grow, but the only thing he may grow is <laughs> the female newscaster winks to the camera, then hauls off and kicks him swiftly. In the balls. <laughs> he screams in pain and then he falls to the floor. Ow, my balls. The people in the studio all laugh like baboons back on female newscaster. <laughs> We go now to Bezeta Jones at the Extreme Court with highlights of today's trial. Exterior <clears throat> Extreme Court Day. It's what used to be the Supreme Court. Dumbed down and extremed out. A female reporter stands in front. Thank you, June. As you awaited trial, not sure had this to say to America. I don't care how many people lose their jobs and starve. I'm the smartest man in history. <laughs> well, we'll see who laughed last today. Interior extreme court day, just like the Supreme Court, but of course dumber. Twelve judges who look more like futuristic pimps sit on the bench. It started off boring and slow with not sure trying to bullshit everyone with a bunch of smart talk. My client wants to address the court, your extremenessness. Joe stands up, addresses the twelve justices. I don't even really understand what I'm on trial for. I never said I was the smartest guy on earth. You people did. I told you not to make me secretary, but you did it anyway. So I just tried to help. I told you it was going to take a long time for the plants to grow. And it will work if you give it a chance. I know it will. Look, even if you find me guilty and lock me away, for your own sake, you can't switch back to Rancho. Eventually, it will kill everything and you'll all starve. you got to believe me. That's all i got to say. Thank you. Uh, your extremeness is... Joe sits. The courtroom is quiet for a beat. Seems like maybe Joe's words sunk in. Then some really stupid music kicks in. The prosecutor gets up and starts dancing around. Prosecutor to turn this trial out. Interior extreme core later. The room is now filled with bikini girls dancing around the prosecutor. Fireworks going off, dry eyes, giant flags. The prosecutor dances around in front of the 12 justices like a rapper doing a call and romance and response. Guilty, guilty, guilty of what? Talking out of his, his butt. butt. Guilty of what? Talking out his butt. Out his butt. Out his butt. <laughs> Into your extreme court later, the chief justice bangs his gavel. Not sure. For ruining this country, we sentence you to rehabilitation. The courtroom cheers. Joe looks a little relieved. Rehabilitation? That doesn't sound so bad. Not so bad. Here's some highlights from last week on rehabilitation. Exterior, giant, scary stadium. A gladiator-style stadium with a giant sign that reads, Rehabilitation. A condemned prisoner runs for his life, pursued by five giant pit bulls and a guy in a golf cart swinging a mace. The pit bulls converge. The prisoner goes down off screen, and there are some awful noises as he gets finished off. The crowd roars its approval. Good luck, not sure. This is Monster Truck Week. Into your prison, visiting area day. Rita visits the condemned Joe. They are separated by thick glass. They speak quiet. So, you think you can escape again, like you did last time? No, they pretty much fixed that. How? They chain me to a big rock. Rita looks over the partition, partition and sees a chain going from Joe's foot to a giant, gigantic boulder. <sighs> Look, Rita, this rehabilitation thing is basically a gladiator-style death sentence. Only one guy out of the last ten made it out alive. Well, you have a good chance then. I bet you're smarter than all those guys. I don't think smart matters when a guy's trying to run you over with a giant truck. Look, Rita, I want you to go to the time machine without me. Don't wait. I wish there was something more I could do. I'm sorry, Joe. Oh, I'm sorry. It's my fault. 
We should have made a run for it when we had the chance. Instead, I had to stay and screw everything up as usual. You didn't screw things up. They did. You were just trying to do the right thing. Yeah, well. Visit's over! Behind Joe, forklift starts rolling the giant boulder he's chained to. I guess I better go. Good luck, Joe. Rita puts her hand up to the glass. Joe gets up to do the same and is immediately yanked back by his chain. Interior giant scary stadium night. Wide establishing shot of the gladiator style stadium with a giant sign that reads rehabilitation. We see a giant Zamboni looking looking thing sweeping up the crushed remains of a vehicle that has been smashed into oblivion. That's three kills and one more to go. Next up for rehabilitation is not sure. Are you ready for some car on car action? The crowd cheers. We see that President Camacho and his cabinet have box seats to this event. How about it for the Dildozer? The crowd cheers as a vehicle the size of four monster trucks comes thundering out the gate like a Freudian nightmare. It has a giant phallic looking drill on it, on the front of it. The Ass Blaster! Another huge truck, a Hummer times. A hundred, but even stupider looking, comes roaring out with a huge phallic looking jackhammer at the front of it, end of it. And the bitch maker! A giant monstrosity with blades in front, like a giant rototiller, but phallic shaped. <laughs> Joe watches in horror from a, from a holding pen, somehow still chained to the giant rock. I never would have guessed that this is how I was going to die. He talks to a guard. I get a car too, right? Yeah, here it comes. A pathetic e econ box the size of a Geo Metro with a flaccid three-foot rubber dildo glued to the hood comes puttering out. The guard <laughs> unlocks Joe's chain and shoves him in the car. He handcuffs, uh, he's handcuffed to the steering wheel. They close the gate behind him. Good luck. The guards start cracking up. Joe tries several times to start the engine. It barely starts. And now, he tried to ruin the country by pouring toilet water on our crops. He cost millions of starving families their jobs! In a wide shot, Joe's tiny pathetic car putters into the arena, dwarfed by the trucks. The three giant monster trucks rev their mighty engines and fire up their weapons. It's deafening. Let's get ready to rehabilitate! Not sure! A loud horn goes off. The bloodthirsty crowd goes wild. The dildozer charges at Joe. Well, can't let him get me without a fight. Bring it on, assholes. He guns it, lurches forward, and immediately stalls. The rubber dildo flops back and splats against the windshield, startling Joe. He frantically restarts it just in time to maneuver the car between the giant wheels of the dildozer, which is so huge and jacked up, it roars right over him without even touching him. Joe gains a little confidence. Allows himself a grin until he sees, wide shot, the dildozer hydraulically dro drops itself down like a lowrider until it's barely clearing the ground. The ass blaster and bitch maker do the same. Oh, shit. Into your White House bedroom, continuous. Rita watches the rehabilitation on TV. Well, this shouldn't take too much longer. The record's five minutes. He's already been in a minute and a half, and as we all know, he's a pussy. Rita can't take it anymore. She turns away and starts sadly packing a suitcase. Diz enters. He's still entering. What's that, Diz? He's trying to figure out the door. I can't figure it's out the door. a bummer about not sure, huh? Yeah. Uh, Diz, you gotta hit the unmute button, hon. Mm. He was a cool guy. I liked him, too. Too bad he had to go because of all that suffering and shit. He just pulls out a folded up paper. Anyway, here's the directions to the time machine. Or I could drive you there if you want. Thanks, Diz. Steer a giant scary stadium night. The bitch maker comes tearing at Joe, doing a wheelie. Joe just barely outmaneuvers him as the giant wheel comes crashing down, missing Joe by an inch. Joe manages to outmaneuver the ass blaster, charging at Joe from the other direction. But then Joe's car stalls out again in the middle of the arena. The ass blaster and the bitch maker position themselves on the opposite sides of Joe. Get ready to smash him. Joe frantically come, tries to restart his car. Come on, come on. The two gigantic trucks come charging at Joe. Joe looks over. Joe looks like a dead man. Then at the last second, Joe's engine turns over just enough to lurch the car forward and out of the way. The two trucks collide. The 
the ass blasters jackhammer gets chewed up by the bench makers roto blades sending shrapnel into the bench makers cockpit knocking out the bench makers driver joe breathes a sigh of relief until he gets rammed by the dildozer from behind sending his car flipping and bouncing several times the crowd goes nuts joe's car lands upside down it looks like it's all over but then he sees that his steering wheel is broken off enabling him to leave the car he climbs out his left hand still cuffed to the broken off steering wheel he takes off running narrowly escaping as the dildozer pulverizes what's left of his car the crowd's loving it the ass blaster backs up and stops the crowd goes wild yelling some kind of one syllable chant that sounds vaguely like dogs <laughs> joe looks confused then a hatch falls open on the back of the ass blaster dumping a load of pit bulls the size of small horses on the arena floor interior white house bedroom continuous Rita and Diz watch the same thing on TV. I can't watch. Rita turns away from the TV and looks out the window. Something catches her eye. Holy shit. Diz, come here, look! Diz comes over to the window. Diz and Rita's point of view. A rose has bloomed, <gasps> along with several other sprouts. The garden seems to be coming to life for the first time. <laughs> it was right, Diz! You gotta get me to the rehabilitation place now! Exterior road night. Diz drives as fast as he can. Rita looks for a way to turn on the radio. How do you turn on the radio? I want to see if Joe's okay. Radio. Radio. The voice activation doesn't work. Diz leans down closer and closer. Radio. Radio. Diz leans down so far into the microphone, he takes his eyes off the road. <laughs> The car goes bouncing off the road into some crops. In the headlights, we see rows and rows of green sprouts growing. Oh my god, he did <laughs> Hurry, Diz! Exterior giant scary stadium night. Joe does his best to keep the pit bulls at bay, running and swinging his steering wheel cuffed to his hand at them and hiding behind the stalled bitch maker. Angle on the stands, Rita and Diz come running in. Rita gets as close as security will allow her to the presidential box and yells down to them. Mr. President! Mr. President, you gotta stop this thing! The crops are growing! President Camacho, with a groupie on each arm, looks back at, at Rita yelling at him. That chick wants me. Joe! I mean, not sure! It was right! It worked! The crops are growing! Camacho yells back to Rita, condescending. Sure they are! You gotta wait your turn, baby! There's enough president for everyone! Rita sees Joe on the Jumbotron. She looks down a few rows and sees a cameraman in the press area covering the action. She gets an idea. Ooh, Diz, go get that guy with the camera and take him to the crops we saw. Take him, tell him to broadcast it everywhere. She pulls a bag, big wad of money out of her bra. Give him this, bribe him. I'm gonna try to stop this thing. Diz runs off, Rita yells to Camacho. <sighs> Mr. President, you gotta believe me! Security guards push Rita back. Security defense recognizes her. Oh, uh, isn't that the not sure as hell? Oh, yeah. It is. Just watch the Jumbotron. You'll see in just a few minutes. The crops are growing. What if she's right? The president considers for a moment. Okay. You got five minutes. Rope! Hearing this, the audience starts chanting. Rope rope rope, 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 rope. is lowered from the ceiling. Joe climbs it as best he can with the steering wheel cuffed to his hand. He gets up, clear of the pit bull's reach, but looking up quickly realizes there's nowhere to climb to but a flat ceiling. It's only there as a cruel joke to prolong his suffering. Rita looks up at the Jumbotron, hoping. Come on, Diz, you can do it. Exterior road night, Diz drives with the cameraman. Something catches his eye. He stops the car. Whoa, look. Diz's point of view, a Starbucks blinking sign that says half off on gentlemen's lattes. Shit, that's a good deal. Diz pulls out the money Rita gave him. I got a bunch of money too. I forgot what it was for. Uh, probably for lattes. Oh yeah, probably. They pull into the Starbucks. Interior giant scary stadium night. Joe holds on to the rope for dear life. He strains to hold on, losing his grip. The dildozer makes another pass at him. Joe yells to the driver. Hey, that other driver called you gay. The dildozer peels out in anger after the ass blaster. The ass blaster charges at Joe, doing a wheelie. 
The dildozer enters frame, slamming into the ass blaster, knocking him upside down. On Rita still being held back by security as she watches Joe look up, looks up at the jumbo truck. Come on, Diz, what's taking so long? Exterior Starbucks night. Diz and the cameraman emerge from the Starbucks, stretching satisfied. Their pace is agonizingly slow. Diz is in his boxer shorts. <laughs> Man, that was great. Yeah. Hey, was I wearing pants when we were in there? Shit. What do I look like? A pants goblin. Another beat of satisfied stretching. Cameraman notices something. Hey, look. Starbucks. Oh, yeah. He <laughs> stared at it for a beat. Something catches Diz's eye. A sign that reads, The Official Exotic Gentleman's Beverage of Rehabilitation. Wait a minute. This reminds me of something. Diz zeroes in on one word. Rehabilitation. He stares at it for a painfully long beat. Uh... Interior giant scary stadium night. The dildozer is the last remaining vehicle. Joe can't hold on to the rope much longer. He starts to slip. The dildozer charges at him. Joe barely pulls himself back up, but he has no more strength. The dildozer circles around, dramatically prolonging the kill. The crowd starts chanting, Grease! 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 Oh, no. Angle on Rita, begging Camacho for more time. Just another five minutes, please! The crowd is getting too angry. They start throwing stuff. Camacho looks back at Rita. He has no choice. Grease! The crowd goes nuts as Grease starts to ooze out of the place where the rope is attached to the ceiling. It drips down towards Joe. Shit. Angle on Rita, watching the Jumbotron. Fingers crossed. Come on, Dez! Exterior Starbucks continuous. Diz is still staring at the word rehabilitation in the Starbucks. Uh, what, what do you what do you keep reading that word for? You dumb. The word dumb seems to have jarred Diz's memory. Words echo in his mind. Dumb. Rehabilitation. Not sure. Dumb? Oh yeah. Not sure. Shit. Into your giant scary stadium night, the grease, the grease slips slowly down the rope to where Joe's hands are, making it too slick to hold on to. He starts to slowly slide down. He falls off the rope, lands in the dirt. Angle on Rita. She looks at the Jumbotron, loses all hope that Diz will come through. On the Dildozer, the Dildozer revs its engine a few times, getting ready for the kill. On Joe, he staggers up, getting ready to run or dodge the Dildozer. Don't. On Rita, she turns away, not wanting to watch Joe get killed. As she looks down, we hear the cheers of the crowd suddenly turn to confused murmurs. Rita allows herself a peek. On the Jumbotron, a green sprout. Yes! Everyone, including President Camacho and the cabinet members, are looking and pointing at the Jumbotron. The camera pans several rows of growing sprouts. Camacho and the cabinet members start to put it together. The driver of the dildos are expecting cheers of bloodlust is confused by the quiet murmurs. He too looks up at the Jumbotron. Joe, adrenalined up, fearing for his life, sees only that the driver of the dildozer is distracted. He makes a run for the abandoned bitch maker. He jumps in, starts it up, and charges at the dildozer. The dildozer's driver doesn't see it coming. Joe does what amounts to, the, to a vehicular sucker punch, slamming the dildozer into the wall. The dildozer bursts into flames. The crowd becomes interested again. Joe sees the driver stuck in the burning dildozer. He watches for a beat. He looks conflicted and then realizes he has to save him. He runs over and pulls the driver out. But as soon as the driver is safe, he immediately starts beating the shit out of Joe. Then the driver grabs an axle rod, comes back over to finish Joe off. President Camacho and the cabinet members see this. They jump out of their box seats. Camacho in the lead, climb into the arena and pull the driver off and beat his ass down, rescuing Joe. Camacho raises Joe's hand in victory, pointing at the sprouts on the jumbotron. The crowd cheers. Joe. Joe. This man just got his ass a pardon. Joe, Joe, Joe. Dissolve to interior White House, lounge area morning. Joe, Rita, and Diz are hanging out, having a little after party, enjoying some food, each eating from their own bucket, watching Ow, my balls on TV. On TV, we see the Ow, my balls guy running around with his crotch on fire, <laughs> ultimately smacking at his crotch and yelling in pain. We see a fireman take aim with one of those high-powered fi fire hoses. 
The high-pressure stream nails him in the ball, lifting him in the air, hurling him 30 feet. He lands, crouched first on a cactus. Ow! My ball! Joe Diz and Rita all have a good laugh. Joe scoops a big bite of food. And this stuff is good. I'm going to miss it. Well, I've got a full part now. We're free to go, so you ready to head to the time machine? I'm not going. Joe is stunned. What? Why not? Uh, I had a, some bad habits back there, and I don't want to fall into again. And what about Upgrade? I think I'm kind of over Upgrade. And without him, I wouldn't even have had a place to stay. You could stay with me and Sharon. That sounds kind of crowded. Oh, it's not so bad. Sharon's ex-boyfriend stayed with us for eight months once while he was starting a record label. It was kind of crowded, actually. He still owes me two thousand dollars. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. Besides, they offer me a pretty good job at Starbucks here. I'm gonna be CEO. Starbucks? You're still gonna paint, aren't you? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, I, I guess this is goodbye then. Rita's sad to see him go, but she can't quite admit it. Joe, also sad, stands awkwardly, not sure what to say. Diz watches them, laughing hornily. Finally, Joe shakes her hand, then picks up his suitcase, getting ready to leave. Hey, Joe. If you ever meet Upgrade, promise me you'll still think of me the way you think of me now. You know, as a painter. Well, of course. Why wouldn't I? You'll see. Spend a little time with Upgrade, and you'll be surprised what starts making sense. The Attorney General, the Secretary of Defense, and the 14-year-old Secretary of the Interior enter, followed by a cute little five-year-old boy smoking a cigarette. Hey, guess what? Camacho is going to make you Vice President. They all start patting him on the back, congratulating. Ah, uh, you guys. Kick off. Oh, and, um, my son wanted to meet you. Is that okay? Y your son? The boy walks up to Joe, shakes his hand. Extreme, say hello to the new vice president. All right, Dad. Says you're going to be the best vice president ever. Well, hold on now. I, I can't accept the job. Cabinet members are stunned. What? Why? I got to get home. But how, how are we going to fix all our problems? Yeah, when you switched to water and you turned off the computer, taxes aren't working now. Yeah, and there's a nuclear or reactor in Florida that's not working and it's leaking or something. I thought it was in Georgia. I thought Georgia's it was in Georgia. in Florida, isn't it? <laughs> Joe starts to look confused and gathers himself. Look, you guys are going to have to solve these problems yourselves. How? You know, you think about it. You work it out. Like we did with the crops. Huh? Ugh. It's so complicated. Uh, the cabinet members all groan, making various giving up noises. Uh, 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 so what if it's complicated? <laughs> The country's depending on you. Come on, you guys. Ugh, forget it. Look, you can't just keep giving up so easily. You've got to take command, make decisions, think about things. If you don't, who will? More blank, uh, confused stares from the camera. Uh -huh. So you're just going to leave us? Look, I don't want to go, but I can't stay. I'm not a leader. I mean, I got lucky once, but I got to get back to my life. But if I leave, you guys, who knows what will happen to the world? Rita senses Joe's wavering. She gets an idea. Joe? I think you should stay. But I can't just... TJ Swans. Rita walks over to Joe, determined on a mission. Joe? Can I talk to you? Alone? Huh? Okay. She pulls him back into the room with the pool table and shuts the door. What's going... Rita jams her tongue down his throat and throws him down the pool, on the pool table. Joe doesn't put up much of a fight, goes with it. The music we heard earlier on the Masturbation Network kicks in. 
This time, a score. Into your White House, lounge area continuous. The cabinet members all crowd around the door to listen. Man, this door's got a keyhole! He leans down to look, but Diz knocks him out of the way like a football player and starts watching. We don't hear Joe and Rita, but from the noises Diz is making, we get the idea that they're, they're going at it pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Oh, way to go. Resolve to interior White House lounge area later. The cabinet members are all sitting around. Joe stumbles out. He's only wearing his underwear, but doesn't seem to care. He looks a little happier and a tad stupider than he did before. He flops down in a chair, grabs a handful of food, and eats it thoughtfully. You know, maybe I don't need to go to that time machine right away. Cabinet members all cheer. Yeah, that ride sucks anyway. Beat? Uh, ride? Smash cut to interior time machine. Joe, Reed, and Diz sit strapped in a car on a track like a typical amusement park or haunted house. A voiceover begins. Note, this is not the computer voice. It's more like a Vincent Price horror movie voice. Welcome to the time machine. We are going to take you back, back, back. First to the year 1939, when Charlie Chaplin and his evil Nazi regime enslaved Europe and tried to take over the world. A spotlight goes on. We see a wax figure of Charlie Chaplin in his classic tramp costume, his arm extended in a Nazi salute amidst a mishmash of various other historical perversions. Angle on Joe and Diz. So you knew this thing was just a ride the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> you thought you could actually travel through time? Well, yeah, I guess. Boy, for the smartest guy in the world, you're pretty dumb. Well, why didn't you tell me? This is a little embarrassed. I like money. I'm sorry. But if it's not a real time machine, there wouldn't have been any money. Long beat on Diz. Trying to put it together. Then. Oh, yeah. Shit. Joe looks at Rita. Well, I guess we're stuck here. Might as well make the best of it. Yup. Joe puts his arm around Rita. They both smile and enjoy the rest of the ride. Uh, fortunately, Charlie Chaplin's evil career was cut short by cocaine addiction. <laughs> mug shots of Robert Downey Jr. with the Charlie Chaplin mustache airbrush oh on. Oh, <laughs> oh, into your house oh, of representing okay. day. Joe's given a speech, being cheered by the congressmen and audience men. Diz is on one side of him and Reed on the other. And so, after serving a short term as vice president, Joe was elected president of America. Diz became vice president, and Rita, the former prostitute, became first lady. Under President Not Shore's leadership, a new era dawned. As the cheers subside, Joe continues his speech. And we need to stop relying on computers all the time and start making more decisions and figuring things out for ourselves. Begin montage. Various people watching his speech people. Various people watching his speech people. Servers in Starbucks, Shantytown Hospital. You know, there was a time when people didn't have computers. It wasn't easy, but they built airplanes and pyramids and ships. Interior living room continuous. The judge from before watches the speech with his family of five, each on their own lazy job. And there was a time in this country, a long time ago, when reading wasn't just for morons. And neither was writing. People wrote books and movies. Movies that had stories, so you cared about whose ass it was and why it was farting. He's not so bad for a dumbass. Back to the House of Representing. We gotta stop calling our women whores. Angle on Rita, she looks around uncomfortably and claps sheepishly. And start calling them chicks again. The crowd cheers. I know these things aren't easy to do. I'm pretty lazy myself. But, you know, sometimes you have to challenge yourself and do something that matters. Because if you don't, you'll wind up with a hollow, empty feeling inside. Beat. The crowd looks a little confused. You mean, like, when you're hungry? <laughs> or like when you got diarrhea? Congressmen all start cracking up and making fire noise. Yeah, why not? Like when you got diarrhea. 
The crowd cheers again. The applause grows and the crowd starts chanting. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. Joe grabs the same big gun President Camacho had and awkwardly shoots in the air. The recoil almost knocks him down as the crowd goes nuts. Exterior Rose Garden, still more years later. Joe and Rita play with their kids. Joe and Rita had three children, the three smartest kids in the world. We pan over to Diz, surrounded by eight girls in bikinis waiting on him hand and foot. Vice President Diz took eight wives and had a total of 30, 32 kids. Several filthy kids run around pulling roses out of the ground, throwing mud. 32 of the dumbest kids to ever walk the earth. Dissolve to interior of the White House, Joe and family relax in the Oval Office. Okay, so maybe Joe didn't exactly save mankind, but he got the ball rolling. And that's pretty damn good for an army electrician. Like we pan a... over to Rita doing a hideously bad oil painting as Joe looks on proudly. Fade out, fade in, coda over credits, exterior filthy street day. We see another pod come to life, creaking open. We pull out to reveal upgrade getting out of the pod. He rises, dusts himself off, starts walking. I'm gonna go find that hoe. The end? Bravo, everyone. Uh, thank you to those who experienced this masterpiece, and good night.